is it um is the no yeah okay. On? It's live. Do they have the link and you sent them the link to Gaza? Okay, excellent. Okay. Okay, uh, good morning, everyone. Welcome back. Um, how's everyone doing? Good. Okay, excellent. So um, today is the second lecture on string theory. And um, today we're going to do a few more uh, equa um Sorry, one second. Today, better, maybe. OK. Uh, Hannah, can you see if they are OK with this volume now? OK. OK. Um, today we're going to do something a bit more quantitative. If you recall, yesterday I mostly just said words. There were almost no equations. Today we're going to start to get a bit more into the meat of things. What I want to talk about today is actually basically symmetries and how they affect things in string theory, but also sort of in physics in general. OK? So let me just remind you where we stopped last time. Last time I said a lot of words about strings and particles and forces. And then we did a little bit of math. We derived we derived the wave equation for waves propagating on strings. And we did that by balancing the forces on a small chunk of string. OK. So ripples on strings satisfy this wave equation. And then we tried to find the most general solution to the wave equation. And that most general solution was given by Fourier series. In a Fourier series, you take your string profile, and you expand it in sines and cosines, and you get these e to the i omegas, which tell you how each Fourier mode oscillates in time. OK. Is everybody happy with Fourier series in general? OK, good. And finally, I said a few words about the action. I said the action for the string was this. If you vary this action, you will get the string equation of motion that I had on the previous slide. Okay? And uh, this is one of your homework problems, though not the one that's due. OK. So next, we're moving on to the next lecture, which is understanding the relativistic string. So I'll explain what that means. While I set this up, are there any quick questions about what we did in the previous lecture? So Hannah, can you ask if they can hear me uh, in Gaza? They asked? OK, they're good. OK, because they sent me a message saying we can't hear him. OK. OK, OK, right, that's true. OK, right, right, makes sense. OK, good. All right, so next, uh, here's lecture two. This is lecture two in this series. And today is symmetries and relativistic strings. OK. All right, so let's begin. So in the last lecture, as I just reviewed, we understood the ordinary non-relativistic string. This is the normal string that if you take your shoelace and stretch it between two points, how it behaves. Today we're going to understand the relativistic string. So first of all, what do I mean when I say relativistic string? What you should imagine is, you should imagine a string where the bits of it, if you make a vibration, the bits of it might be moving quickly compared to the speed of light. Okay. And you get new structure when that's possible. And we'll explain this as we go along. But this is what I mean by relativistic string. I mean a string that is constrained 
by the framework of special relativity. So we're going to discuss relativistic symmetry soon. But before I do that, I want to remind everyone about a few things about ordinary normal rotational symmetry. OK? All right. So here is the x, y, you know, here is the, the two-dimensional plane. I have put a coordinate system on it called x and y. OK? Here is a point in the x, y plane. All right. Now everyone knows that you can rotate your coordinate system, right? You are free to use a different coordinate system, which I'm going to call x prime and y prime. All right. The coordinates of a point in the xy coordinate system are related to the coordinates of the same point in the x prime y prime coordinate system by this matrix right here. Cosine theta, sine theta, sine theta, cosine theta. Blah. OK. Now, imagine you have a world that is invariant under this symmetry. Okay, what does this really mean? Assume that the physics doesn't care if you change your coordinate system. This is pretty much always the case. Okay? Your physics shouldn't care if you change the coordinate system used to describe it. Whenever you have such a situation, you should always ask yourself, what is invariant under the symmetry? What is it that does not change under the symmetry? So for example, how about the x-coordinate of the point? Does that change under the symmetry? Yes, right? x becomes x prime. x prime is not the same thing as x. It's rotated you know, in some way. So for example, the x-coordinate obviously changes. And so does the y-coordinate. So they are not invariant. But if you look at the distance from the origin to this point, that's uh, x squared plus y squared, which is equal to x prime squared plus y prime squared. Right? If you work through the algebra, you get some cosines, you get some sines, you get cosine squared plus sine squared, it's equal to 1. This is equal to that. Physically, this is completely obvious. right? If you look at the distance from here to there, if I measure this distance using a ruler, the distance the ruler couldn't care less which coordinate system I'm using. It's just the distance from here to there. Okay? These things sound really obvious. right? And, uh, it's just, this is the basic idea behind symmetry. So I'm just drumming this into your head for what's going to come next. OK. This is something a little bit more complicated. Let's imagine we have two points A and B, and we don't connect them by a straight line. Instead, we draw some sort of curvy line between these two points. And now we have some sort of ant crawling on this curvy line. All right? The ant measures the distance from A to B. Does this distance depend on the coordinate system? No, obviously not. The ant doesn't know about coordinates. It's an ant. So the, no matter what coordinates you use, you always get the same distance. Let's quickly derive a formula for this distance. This is basic calculus, but let's go through it. OK, so here's my curve. Here's my ant. So let's derive a formula for the distance along this curve. So here's x and here's y. Let me zoom in on a little chunk of this thing. OK, so here's a little chunk of this line. So this little chunk has a little distance in x, which I call delta x, and a little distance in y, which I call delta y. What is this distance from here to there? Well, by Pythagoras, delta s squared from here to there, the length along the chunk, is equal to delta x squared plus delta y squared. Right. Let me call sigma a parameter that moves along this line. Okay, so sigma is, for example, 0 here and 1 there. In that case, again, by calculus, delta x is equal to dx d sigma times d sigma. Right? Delta y is dy by d sigma times d sigma. So in other words, this thing is just this thing right here. And now I want to find the total length along the curve. What that means is you add up each little chunk as you go along the curve. So you sum over all these delta s's. 
And then you take that limit, you take delta s really small, and then you do this normal calculus stuff, and you end up with an integral along the curve, where the thing in the integral is integral d sigma, because the sigmas are coming from there, of the square root of dx squared d sigma plus dy d sigma squared. Okay. Is everyone happy with this derivation? Again, this is pretty much basic calculus. And I'm sure you've all seen this before. So there's one thing I want to point out here. This formula is invariant under rotations. Okay? In particular, if I do the rotation on the previous slide, this one right here, then you can check that this formula here is invariant under rotations. By which I mean, if you work through the math, x equals to cosine theta x prime plus sine theta y prime, and you go through the whole thing, you get the same formula again, except with x prime and y prime. Okay? And this is happening because the ant does not know about coordinates, so whatever distance the ant measures better not care about the coordinate system. Okay? So again, this is all pretty much common sense, I think. This should make sense. Okay. So now, is everyone happy with rotational symmetry? Yes? Good. Let's move on to something slightly more complicated. So for example, I did that for a two-dimensional, an ant crawling on a two-dimensional surface. But it should be clear, this should work for any number of dimensions, right? For example, if I had a three-dimensional, you know, an ant somehow flying, or sorry, not an ant anymore, a mosquito flying through a three-dimensional uh, space, it's clear that what I do is I just add a dz d sigma squared to this formula, and I will get the length of the curve in the three-dimensional space. In fact, because I'm a string theorist, I'm going to find it really helpful soon to work in an arbitrary number of dimensions, which I will call d. The generalization of this formula to an arbitrary number of dimensions looks like this. Okay? So what is this? This is the Kronecker delta matrix, which is this. It's just the identity matrix. There's ones along the diagonals and zeros everywhere else. And this is just this formula right here in any number of dimensions. If you work out what this is, you will see it becomes dx1 d sigma squared plus dx2 d sigma squared plus dx3 d sigma squared, blah, 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 blah. OK. I just want everyone to keep that in mind, because we have to soon start working in numbers of dimensions that are much larger than 3. And finally, let's do something a little bit harder. Let's derive a formula for the area of a 2D surface sitting in three dimensions. So what we just did was we derived a formula for the length of a line in three dimensions. Let's now do a 2D surface in three dimensions. OK. So have people seen formulas for deriving these areas before? Um, I'm seeing mixed responses. So let me go through this a little bit slowly. Because again, in string theory, pretty much it's these ideas that we're going to use over and over again. So first of all, if you want to know how a surface, if you want to parametrize a surface in three dimensions, what do you do? How do you think about it? What information do you have to give to describe how a surface lives in three dimensions? Yes? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Small square every month sum. Let me go through the details of that in a second. But yeah, that's exactly what we're going to do. We're going to do a small square, and then we're going to Riemann sum the small square. So this is, this is exactly what I'm getting at. So keep this in mind. But let me just be a bit more abstract for a second. A surface is parametrized by a vector function of two variables. So for example, here's sigma. Let me call those two variables sigma 1 and sigma 2. To describe a surface in three dimensions, what you have to say is you have to specify the x, y, and z coordinates of every point along the surface. So for example, if I have this piece of paper, imagine I have sigma 1 running along here and sigma 2 running along here. Then what I have to do is tell you how each value of sigma 1 and sigma 2 maps to in space. Okay. So if I tell you all of those things, if I tell you these three functions, the x coordinate of sigma 1 and sigma 2, the y coordinate of sigma 1 and sigma 2, the z coordinate of sigma 1 and sigma 2, then you know how the surface sits in space. There should be a formula for the area using this data. 
So let's derive that formula using this Riemann sum idea. So this is pretty much the same thing as we did for the line. It's just a bit more complicated because there are a bit more angles. So let's take my sigma 1, sigma 2 plane, OK? And now let's take a small square with sides d sigma 1 and d sigma 2. Now, if I sit here and I move here on this little line in the sigma space, that little line maps to a little line in the real space, right? What is this little vector here? This little vector, dv1 here, which is the image of this thing under this map, that little line is the derivative of x, which is a function of sigma 1, sigma 2, d sigma 1 times the differential d sigma 1. These were a lot of words, but hopefully this makes sense. If you move in the sigma 1 direction, you move also in along the surface in some direction given by this vector. And the same for this other little vector here, dv2. So I have these two vectors, dv1 and dv2. What is the area of this little square? Well, you know what the area is, right? It's the length of dv1 times the length of dv2 times the angle between them, which is sine theta. Now, how do I figure out an angle? You know, there are many ways to figure out the angle. The way that I'm going to use is I'm going to take the dot product of dv1 with dv2. Okay? That doesn't give you the sine of the angle. That gives you the cosine of the angle. So then I'm going to subtract that from the overall norm, OK? So I have here 1 minus cosine squared theta. The difference between those two is sine squared theta. Then I take the square root. And it turns out this dv1, dv2 just comes out in front, OK? So everyone can go through this algebra at home, but it's quite simple. OK, so this is the area of this little chunk in terms of dv1, dv2. And now we do the Riemann sum. So we sum over all possible little chunks. We take each little chunk smaller and smaller. Each little chunk becomes an integral. And we get an integral of d sigma 1, d sigma 2 times a thing, a particular combination of derivatives, which follows from using the definition of dv1 and the definition of dv2. And we get this thing right here. This is the area of the surface as a function of the coordinates of the surface in space. OK. Is everyone happy with, uh, with this derivation? Um, any questions about this? We are halfway to string theory now, actually. OK. Uh, have people seen formulas like this before, actually? Um, yeah, OK, good. This will be important in a second. OK. And now that we have this area formula, what do we do with it? You know, lots of things you can do with this area formula. One thing that you often learn in sort of uh, classical mechanics courses is, you can use this area formula to find minimal surfaces. So for example, suppose you take um, uh, this thing where you take two rings, and you take uh, soap and water, and you dip them into the soap and water, and you spread them apart. The soap bubble that forms always minimizes the area. right? You can find that minimum area by taking that formula and doing variational calculus on it. Okay? So you vary this x coordinate. And you see what minimizes the area, and you get a formula for it. And I think it's cosh or something like that. All right. So we're going to do something very similar for our string theory in a second. OK, any questions about rotational invariance before we move on? OK, good. Oh, sorry, was there a question? Or, um, no. OK, if we understand rotational invariance, we are very close to understanding something different which is relativistic invariance. So let me now take a few seconds to talk about relativistic symmetry. What does rotational symmetry tell us? Physically, rotational symmetry means if you have something and you rotate it, it doesn't matter. The physics is the same. And that actually greatly constrains the structure of the equations. For example, this equation right here is invariant under rotational symmetry. We would not have gotten the same equation if, for example, the x dimension was very different from the y dimension. Okay? So symmetry constrains your equations. And rotational symmetry means it doesn't matter if you rotate your coordinates. Now, relativistic symmetry is something different. 
special relativity tells you it doesn't matter if you are in a moving reference frame, provided the reference frame is moving at a constant speed. Let's think about what that means. That means if you're in a truck and the truck is sealed, OK? Let me build some backstory. Suppose you're in this truck and this truck is sealed because your friends have put you in this truck. And you are trying to figure out if the truck is moving or not at a constant speed. There is nothing you can do to figure this out. Because whether or not the truck is moving, the laws of physics remain the same. Okay? So you can do anything in this truck. Because the laws of physics are invariant under changing the reference frame, there is no way you can figure it out. OK. So people have heard these words before, I think. But this is really the basic idea behind special relativity. Let's do some equations for this. So now, instead of, x, instead of x and y, I'm going to talk about x and t. Okay? So this is space, one spatial dimension, and this is time. Now, here are the formulas that relate coordinates in special relativity. Have people seen these formulas before? OK, good. It should be familiar to most people. Physically, what do these formulas mean? Well, OK, v is a speed. And these formulas relate to coordinate systems. If one of them is at rest, then the t prime, if t and x are at rest, then the t prime and x prime coordinate system are moving with a constant velocity v. Okay? So here, gamma is this thing which is a 1 over square root, 1 minus v squared over c squared. c is the speed of light. And you can see that x and t get mixed up by this coordinate transformation. right? OK. So is it clear to everyone why this one is moving if this one is not? For example, if you look at the point that is at x equal to 0 in this coordinate system, then in the x prime coordinate system, it's changing. right? x prime is now gamma v t. So in other words, it used to be at rest at x equal to 0. Now it's moving with some velocity. OK. Now, again, you can draw the x prime and the t prime axes, and they look like this. Now, I want to point out something about the structure of this transformation right here. So from now on, I am going to set the speed of light to 1. OK? If you do that, and if you define a new variable eta, which is defined in the following way, cosh eta is 1 over the square root of 1 minus v squared. Okay, so this is the gamma factor if c is 1. Then those formulas that I had on the previous slide, these ones that everyone knows, look like this. Okay? t prime x prime is cosh eta sinh eta sinh eta cosh eta times tx. This looks nicer, right? The other one looked a bit random. There was gammas all over the place. Some of them had c, some of them didn't. This is the real structure inside this formula. Okay? So something should be immediately clear. This is extremely similar to rotational invariance. Right? If you take theta to i eta, and you maybe have to mess with some other signs, I can't remember, you get exactly this thing here. So what I want to point out is, conceptually, special relativity is the same thing as rotational invariance. Rotational invariance says you can mix x and y. Special relativity says you can mix time and space. That's it. Okay. Is everybody happy with this basic idea? So now we're going to take this and we're going to propagate all this stuff through and redo all the things we did previously, except with relativistic symmetry. Okay. okay. So first of all, what is invariant under relativistic symmetry? Remember, under rotational symmetry, I said that the distance from here to here was invariant. Under relativistic symmetry, there is still a notion of distance, but it's different because this is a cosh and not a cosine. So if you ask what is invariant, well, you know, t itself is not invariant. Sorry, that should have been a t. Um, x itself is not invariant. But the combination of t squared minus x squared is invariant. 
For rotational symmetry, we had a plus sign here. Now we have a crucial minus sign. And that minus sign is there because of this structure right here. This combination of t and x uh, is typically called the relativistic interval. It is the invariant distance under a coordinate boost, under a change to a moving reference frame. OK. Let's keep going. So previously, we had an ant crawling along a path in space. Now, I'm going to discuss something different. Each of us live in space-time. Okay. So in other words, we are, for example, right now, I'm at a particular point in space, but I'm still moving in time. Right? I started this lecture about half an hour ago, and I will move through time. Well, okay, hopefully, I'll keep on moving through time forever. But uh, at some point, this lecture will end at t final. Okay. During the course of the lecture, I'm walking along. I'm moving over here. So I move a little bit in space, but I move mostly in time. And here's another thing. With the ant, we had the proper distance along this line. And I said that that proper distance that the ant measured did not care about the coordinates. A slightly less obvious fact is, if me or you or anyone moves along a trajectory in space-time, the time that you measure does not depend on the coordinate system you use. So let's now try to derive a formula for the time elapsed along an arbitrary trajectory in space-time. It's going to be the same thing as the ant, just with a few extra minus signs. So how do we do it? Well, again, it's really a lot like before. Okay. Previously, we had this ant, and we looked at a little chunk here. Now we look at a little chunk along this space-time trajectory. This little chunk will move a little bit in x, and it'll move a little bit in time, okay? because the path is parametrized by a function t. In other words, t of sigma tells me how I move through space, sorry, how I move through time, and x of sigma tells you how I move through space. So this path is parametrized by a function t of sigma and a function x of sigma. So if I look at this little chunk, then there's a little distance delta t and a little distance delta x. But now, because the time elapsed along the path is invariant, how can that time elapsed depend on t and x? Well, it has to be invariant, which means it must be delta t squared minus delta x squared. Does this make sense to everyone, why there's a minus sign there? Sorry? Because of what? Sorry? Well, you could think of it because there's an i complex. But I think the way I'd like you to think about it is from this instead. OK? Because notice the only combination of t and x that is invariant has to be t square minus x square. OK? So that's the way I would encourage everyone to think about it. There's different ways to think about it where you can stick some i's in different formulas. I have to confess, I don't like those very much, but this is a matter of taste. Um, but yes? Yeah. Oh, good. I set c to 1. So actually, it's c squared t squared minus x squared. But c is 1. So therefore, this is invisible to me. Yeah. I'm really glad I put that there. Yes. But c is 1. Yes. OK. I think Anne is keeping C in her lectures today. Is that right? Trying to, yeah, OK. But the truth is, most of us working in this field set C to 1 so many years ago that it's an extremely difficult thing to put it back everywhere. So I am not even trying. I just set C to 1 from now on. Okay. And uh, I'll point out that setting C to 1 is useful because the formulas look really pretty if you set C to 1. Look, this is this cosh cinch thing. It's really kind of nice. Okay. So setting C to 1 is a natural thing to do when you're thinking about relativity. Good. Um, other questions? before I move on. So again, let me just remind you, this distance is invariant if you put a minus sign there. And because we want this distance, this time that I measure to be invariant, that is why I'm putting the minus sign here in between these two. Okay? This is the only formula that is consistent with this relativistic invariance. 
There is no other formula that is consistent. Okay. Okay. So there's a minus sign in between these two things. And now I do the same thing. I do this Riemann sum. I sum over all of these little chunks of d sigma. I sum over all of them. As I take the d sigma very small, the sum becomes an integral. And I get this thing right here, which again should look really, really familiar to everyone. It's the same as the formula for the ant distance that I had previously, but with a minus sign there. By construction, this formula is invariant under this transformation, which means that it's invariant under this transformation, because they're the same transformation. These transformations are called Lorentz transformations, and the point is this formula is invariant under them. Okay? So the thing I want you to take away from this is not actually the specific formula, but the idea that when you have a symmetry, that symmetry greatly constrains what you can do, what terms you can add to your equations. I couldn't have made this a plus because that wouldn't be invariant. I can't just add an extra term, dx d sigma, because that wouldn't be invariant. It really has to be this. Okay? And this idea is much more powerful than the things I'm going to tell you about string theory. OK, any questions about this formula before I move on? OK, good. So again, it should be clear that we can do this in any number of dimensions d. Okay, so for example, we can add an extra spatial dimension, and all that means is we just add an extra minus dy d sigma squared here. And in fact, because I like to work in an arbitrary number of dimensions, I'm going to write down this formula right here. This is the generalization of that formula to any number of dimensions. It has a dxi d sigma, a dxj d sigma, and they're contracted against this matrix right here. Okay. This matrix is called the Minkowski metric. Anne has had that matrix, I believe, on her, I believe she wrote it on the board, actually, at some point. But this matrix is a lot like the Kronecker delta. There's just a crucial minus sign here in the time direction, and all the rest are positive. This minus sign is the thing I keep going on and on about, because this minus sign is the only difference between time and space. OK, okay good. So now we finally have all the tools that we need to come to the relativistic string. Okay? So let's describe the relativistic string. So what is a string? When I say string, you probably think of an object that's one-dimensional, right? Because a string is a one-dimensional loop. But that's only true at an instant in time. If you think about a string, at any instant in time, it's a loop in space. But of course, all of us live in space-time, including this string. So in space-time, a string actually sweeps out a two-dimensional surface in space, right? Because at every point in time, the string is a loop in space. This 2D surface is called the world sheet. It's just a name. But our task as string theorists is to understand the dynamics of the world sheet, understand how it moves through space and time. And that's really the goal of today. So let's think about this. We already have the tools that we need because we already figured out how a 2D surface in space behaves. The only thing now we have to do is figure out how a 2D surface in space time behaves. But because we know about this relativistic symmetry, it's easy to figure out how to put time in. We just have to change a few signs here and there to have the minus sign. And then we'll get the equation that describes how strings move in space time. So just as before, my string is a two-dimensional surface in space time. And it's a function of two variables. Previously, I called them sigma 1 and sigma 2. I'm now going to call them sigma and tau, because one of them is more like a time coordinate, and one of them is more like a space coordinate. But my string is a function of two variables, tau and sigma. I should tell you how each point on the string, which is a function of sigma and tau, lives in real space. So it has to live at a certain point in x, y, and z, and also at a certain point in time. So I have to specify for you four functions of two variables, which are sigma and tau. 
Now we can calculate the area of the string just the same way as we did before. What we do is we look for an area which is invariant under relativistic symmetry. We do that by dividing space up into little chunks of width d sigma and d tau, figuring out the area of each chunk, and then adding up all the chunks. Because I've literally done this three times already, I'm not going to do it again, but you do exactly the same thing. And there are just some minus signs that are different. In particular, this dot product that I've drawn right here is a dot product that involves this minus sign, this minus sign right here. Okay? But you get the idea by now. You get something which looks pretty much exactly like the area of a normal 2D surface in three dimensions, just with a few minus signs here and there. But this is profound enough that this has a name. This object right here is called the Nambu Goto action. It is a number that you associate with a string trajectory through space time. Okay? It is the only number you can associate with it that is invariant under relativistic symmetry. OK. So this is a kind of area that you can associate with the string. I say kind of area because part of the string is living in time and part of it is living in space. So it's a slightly strange object, but conceptually, it's still like an area. Okay. So now I have to tell you a fact about how strings move through space and time. So here's a fact about how they move. Strings move through space and time in a way that extremizes their area. So for every string trajectory in space and time, you know, you could have the string pretty much living like this, or you can have the string wiggling and rippling as it moves through space and time. This is like a string that's expanding and contracting. This is like a string that's OK, and suddenly it expands, and then it contracts again. Each of these string world sheets has a different area which you can calculate like this. The way that the string actually moves through space and time is in a way that will extremize the area. Okay. So in other words, we, of all of these things, we should figure out which of them is an extremum, and that is how the string will move. So this should remind you of classical mechanics. In classical mechanics, you know that particles move in a way that extremizes their action. Right? You have the integral of the Lagrangian, which is the action. Particles always move in a way that extremizes that action. In string theory, it's the same, but strings move through space and time in a way that extremizes their area. Okay. Are there any questions about this uh, before I go to some formulas? Yes? Yeah, yes. Yeah, that's right. So all strings will move in a way that extremizes their area. This area functional is the same for all strings. Good. There are many solutions to this thing. Okay. There's one equation, but there are many, many solutions to it. So those solutions are different. Okay. So we'll discuss this in a second, but this is a very good point. Okay. There's one equation, but many solutions. That's how we distinguish them which is good because there are many different kinds of particles and we better find a way to distinguish them. Okay, this is an excellent question. Good. Um, other questions? Okay. So here's what we now want to do. What you want to do is take this thing and you want to vary these coordinates in such a way as to minimize or maximize, really to extremize this area. Now, this is a minimal surface problem. This is a minimal area problem that is really similar to the soap bubble problem that I discussed. Okay? So I think that you all know how to do it. It's actually kind of like lengthy, the variation. So I'm not going to do it. But you all know how from your classical mechanics class. Take this thing, vary these coordinates x, and find an equation of motion. Okay. So in other words, you do exactly this. You do the calculus of variations. You demand that the variation of this area be 0. And then you do a lot of algebra, actually. And then you do a, a bunch of stuff, which um, I'm not going to do at all. But I'll take this point to advertise a book. This book is pretty much what I'm following for, this, for these lectures. And there are about three chapters of this book 
that are dedicated to exploring all the intricacies of, of this thing. So I encourage everyone to go through this. It's very interesting. Once you go through it, at the end of the day, you have to pick these sigma and tau coordinates in a certain fashion. But if you do it right, you get an equation for the movement of the string. And that equation is just this. Okay? It's really simple, the equation. It's just the wave equation that we had previously with a few important differences that I want to point out. So first of all, imagine you have a string living here. Now suppose I take that string and I push it in the same direction that it's extended. So my string is extended like this, and then I push it this way. It's a sort of longitudinal push of the string. Is it different? Thoughts? Anyone? Does it look different? You know, if I have a, I should have brought some string. But if you have a string and you push it that way, nothing changes, right? Here's my string. I push it this way. It's the same, right? There's nothing different about it. In other words, the longitudinal motion of the string doesn't matter. Okay? It's the same in time, actually. If you take the string in time, a string is a sheet which extends in space and in time. If I push it in space, nothing happens. If I push it in time, nothing happens. In other words, motion of the string that is longitudinal in either space or time does not affect anything. It turns out there is no equation for that motion because it doesn't matter. Okay? On the other hand, if I have a string and I pluck it, if I make it vibrate perpendicular to its extent, that's a transverse vibration of the string. That obviously does matter, and so we should obviously get an equation for it. And that's why this equation right here has directions, only cares about the transverse components of the string. Okay? Suppose I have a string in three space and one time dimension. How many transverse components does it have? OK, I have many different numbers. We have one vote for four, but how many transverse? I have one vote for three. Uh, I'm going to keep on. Uh, Keep on pointing until someone says a slightly different number. Um, so uh, let's keep going in that direction. So here's a string. We're in, we're in space and time. Now, one of the dimensions doesn't matter, right? OK, so the z dimension, say, doesn't matter. This one matters, and this one matters. Two, good. We have two transverse components, OK? And we have two longitudinal components in z and in time. Those don't matter. Okay? So transverse just means if you take a string and you move it, it actually matters. Okay? So there are two transverse components in four dimensions. To warm up for later, if I have d dimensions, how many transverse components do I have? d minus 2. Good. d minus 2. All right. Remember that for next lecture. Okay. So in other words, in d dimensions, we have d minus 2 components, but let's stick to 4 for now. Okay? So in other words, we get one wave equation for each, uh, for each, uh, each transverse component of the string. OK. OK. What is the difference between this wave equation and the one that we discussed yesterday? There's another important difference. What is it? Yes? Good. In the other one, we had a factor here, okay, which is mu naught over t naught. That factor is not here anymore. If I put back all the units, that factor would have been c. But c is 1. So in other words, the waves on this string move at the speed of light. Okay? This is an important fact. For a relativistic string, any ripples on the string move at the speed of light. OK, okay good. Oh, this is exactly this. Waves on the string propagate at the speed of light. Okay. OK, now let's try to solve this wave equation. We already did this, in fact. The most general solution to the wave equation, we do it using Fourier transforms. It looks like this. Okay? I am not writing this with sines and cosines, because I'm now imagining having a string that is closed. Okay? In other words, the string comes back to itself. The previous thing, I had the string that was open and tied, because that was sort of more physical in everyday life. For string theory, I'm going to want to talk about a closed string. So imagine a string that comes back to itself. What that means is these things that we have here, sigma moves us along the string direction. 
So as I move in sigma along, I better come back to myself. Okay. So let me just discuss some of the component, some of the, the components of this thing right here. Okay. So x is my string coordinate. Okay. We have an equation for it, which is this. It is convenient to take a, a factor with dimensions of length out from this whole thing. So the overall scale of the string, I'm going to call L sub s. L sub s is called the string length. And I'm just taking it out from here, because then everything else that appears here has no dimensions. And that's a convenient thing to do. OK. Now, remember I said my string is closed. That means that instead of writing sines and cosines, like sine sigma, cosine sigma, I'm going to write complex exponentials. That's not really very important. It's just more convenient. But because my string is closed, I want it to come back to itself when I take sigma through, say, 2 pi. What that means is this n that appears here in this exponent must be an integer. Okay. And now what you do is you take this thing and you plug this back into this equation. And you can check that if there's an n here in sigma, there has to also be an n here in time. And we discussed this already, actually, last lecture. It's the same thing that we discussed then. It's just telling you that to solve this equation using this Fourier transform, the oscillation frequency in time is related to the wave number of the excitation in space. Okay? And this, I think, everyone knows. And you can also check that this thing is a solution for all choices of a n. Okay? This n here is the momentum, or sorry, I'll get to that in a second. And finally, there's an index here, i. This is because the string can oscillate in a different way in each transverse direction. Okay? So there's a fair amount of information in here, but really it's just a Fourier solution to this equation. Okay? And one of the problems on the sheet encourages you to check that indeed this is a solution to that, but hopefully it's fairly clear from your earlier courses on string motion. Okay. So now let me just discuss the physics a little bit more of what I just told you with pictures. So remember, I have a closed string. So here's a picture of a closed string that's not doing very much. The overall size of the string is L string. OK, that's this L string right here. Now imagine I take this A, say I take A1. OK, I take A sub 1, so I set n equal to 1, and I crank it up a little bit. So I take that 1 and I make it bigger. Then that guy couples to a certain thing in space. All right. So for example, A1 looks something like this. As I move around this thing once, I fit in a single wave into this closed string. Okay. This is the simplest thing that I can fit there. So the vibration that I'm going to get in time associated with A1 looks kind of like this. I have this string, and it'll vibrate in this way. Okay. Now, A2 is different. Right? If you look at A2, A2 multiplies something that's like e to the 2i sigma, which means I have two periods as I go along the string, which means that it doesn't just oscillate once in space. It has two periods as it goes along and oscillates twice. It should be clear by now that this n can be any integer. And this integer tells you the wave number of the excitation. These are the different harmonics of the string that I told you about. And classically, these a's can take on any value that they want. OK, it'll still be a solution. OK, are there any questions about this? OK, very good. So that is actually, uh, I thought I had a final slide. That is actually the end of this lecture. So in this lecture, we discussed the classical motion of the string. And to be honest, the most important thing that we did conceptually was to understand that symmetries constrain our equations. And the most important thing that we did for string theory is we wrote down this general solution to the string motion. Okay? So this is where we'll take it on in the next lecture. OK, questions? Yes. Good. So let me repeat the question, because I've realized that um, I keep forgetting this. But in Gaza, they cannot hear your question. They can only hear me talk. But the question was, time flows differently in different, in different places in some way. Why is it that we have only one time dimension and several different spatial dimensions? Is that right? That, is that the question? 
Yeah. This is a fact about our universe that we have only one time dimension and several spatial dimensions. It turns out that there is, even though time can flow differently in different places in space, it turns out that you can make it work. Okay? You can build an invariant theory of the universe with only one time dimension and three spatial dimensions. Okay? So let me show you a couple of the things that make this possible. So for example, this metric here has only one minus sign and several positive signs. That's OK. okay? You can build a relativistically invariant theory with that that doesn't cause any problems. All right? It's just a fact about our universe that our universe chose the one that has one time and several space dimensions. I don't know why. You can actually imagine universes that aren't like that. They seem to make sense, I, I think. Um, but that's not the one that we live in. We just live in one like this, and it's perfectly fine. Okay? I don't know, yeah, I don't know what to say to that why question. A lot of why questions don't really have answers. I can just say, the way it is. So um, this is one of them. We have one time dimension because it's the way it is. So, yeah, good. Um, other questions? Oh, sorry. Anne, I realize, yeah. Um, Hannah, could you uh, help me with the microphone? Actually, do we have any questions from Gaza? Or? They may have lost uh, the signal, yeah. If we had more than one time dimension, wouldn't we violate causality? Um, good. That's a good point. Uh, let's see. Good. I've not thought about that very hard. Wouldn't we violate causality? I think we would clearly violate the notion of causality that we know and love from our everyday life with one time dimension. I wonder if there would be a better notion of causality that we would get instead, and then that would be OK. I, I don't really know. It's a, it's a good question, right? Um, you could have a relativistically invariant theory with two time dimensions and two space ones that would be invariant under a different group, I guess, SO2, two, instead of SO3, one. And so maybe that would result in a different notion of causality. I really have no idea, to be honest. Yeah. So um, okay. maybe, yeah. It's a, it's, a, it's a good question. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Violet causality, the way that we currently formulate it. So it would look totally different. Imagine how confusing it would be. You know, you're trying to meet someone at 2 p.m. And it's no longer necessary to say 2 p.m. You'd be like, I'll meet you at the square at 2 p.m. and 5 p.m. You know, because you could miss them because you have to specify two different time coordinates. So it would be extremely confusing, you know, in that way. So that would be bad. But um, yeah. Good. Um, any other questions? OK. Uh, in that case, um, we can, uh, what is on our schedule? We can, uh, we can pause um, for a 15 minute break, and then we'll restart again in 15 minutes for cosmology. Thank you, everyone. I think they lost power. That happens. At least I'm not even, like, I don't know. If, like, they just got a green light. There's a green with a circle in it for me. Uh, Do you have the same? What does that uh, mean? White. Yeah, what does that mean? That's different from straight up green, right? Yeah, I Yeah, they texted me on Facebook. They lost power. Yeah. <laughs> Clearly, that's right. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't know. Yeah. It's better question. So, is this some, is some people have studied then? Uh, I think I didn't know that. Um, I, d I don't yeah. know. Okay, I don't okay. know. Right. I just read my. Yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah. It's better question. It violates causality as we know it. Yeah, that's what the, as we know um, it. Whether I we could reformulate it in um, yeah. using SOT to, to, I wouldn't know. Yeah, right. Never it would, it would be very confusing, right? Because, yeah. Um, yeah, this, this two times thing would be really confusing, right? I guess? Yeah. Time like trajectories would. I have no idea. Because you could just...
whatever you might like the way you in which you might end up getting your first time like you know yeah you would right yeah. you would I think right yeah. because yeah. you could move in yeah you could move in a loop in the two time directions right yeah is that right do I understand that correctly if it was r two in the two time directions then you could just move in only those right oh well, that's a good answer ah you should have answered that that's that's well, a really good answer though right yeah yeah well, you just scored that yeah it's an extremely good answer though right yeah. Okay, very good, very good. No, I think that's totally good, right? Um, yeah, you, you could have time machines and stuff. That didn't occur to me at all. No, it didn't occur to me until I just said that. Brilliant, <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> so that, that suggests there's no way to, like maybe there's a notion of causality, but it's so different from the one yeah, that we know. Yeah, but that, yeah, we know. could be, I think we could make a time machine. Yeah, yeah. you yeah. could make a time machine, that would be a disaster. No, it'd yeah. be great, wouldn't it? Yeah. <laughs> okay, yeah, like a disaster would be great. So we're being very quiet today. We lost power. Sorry? We lost power. We missed most of the transition with some questions. Oh, that was shut them up, wasn't it? Yeah. I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry yeah. Oh, yeah, so, um. <laughs> no, it's just a bit unfortunate. Yeah. See what happens. Will it work? I always have to fix my idea this. Sometimes I plug it in and it doesn't work. Perfect. Okay. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. Yeah. Because I didn't have that. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's good. Let me get a coffee. Let's talk a little bit while okay. I do.
this in the right place? Can you hear me? Oh, it's okay. Have you got enough stuff? Okay, uh, we're very happy for the second lecture of the day to have Anne, and the last lecture of her series will tell us today about gravitational waves. Okay, well, thank you. Um, after the first lecture on Sunday, somebody asked me, how can I find out more information? And I can't remember who it was. Um, so here, there's a couple of very um, introductory books on cosmology. They are both available as PDFs online. One by Andrew Liddell, one by Barbara Ryden. Um, they're easy to read, they could be perhaps a bit basic, but I mean, it's a good source. And it goes, it does things that I haven't actually covered. Um, there's, online, there's some lecture notes by Andrew Jaffe of Imperial College. Um, I haven't really, I only just found these actually uh, when I was here. So I haven't actually looked in detail at them to judge the level. Um, and I found them, actually, from my friend David Tong. I found, actually, he has some lecture notes on cosmology. I don't know why he has them, because he's never lectured that, to my knowledge. But he says it's a first-year undergraduate level. And it has links from his webpage to several other books on cosmology, all available online, including Andrew Jaffe's lecture notes. Now, what's important about David Tong is that in October, he is lecturing cosmology in Cambridge. He'll be lecturing the same lecture course that I lectured several years ago, and I was using my own notes for the two lectures on cosmology. David is a brilliant lecturer, and he writes up his notes in LaTeX and puts them on his webpage. So if you watch David's webpage, you'll find that some lecture notes on cosmology it'll probably be called Part 2 Cosmology, will appear. They won't appear in October, but they may appear by about end of December. Yeah. Um, Black holes in general relativity. Well, I f um, this is not my subject area. I've never lectured it before. Um, there's a couple of books online. A first course in general relativity by Bernard Schultz. It has something on the Schwarzschild solution and on gravitational waves. It's much more advanced than what I am doing, but because it actually introduces general relativity, whereas I'm trying to avoid it. Um, and there's lecture notes on general relativity by Sean Carroll. The PDF is available on archive.org. So Sean's lecture notes were a precursor 
to a book he wrote. Um, it's a fantastic book, but the lecture notes are online. The book, I don't, I don't think it's available as a PDF. I couldn't find it anyway. I should say Bernard's book is available as a PDF. And, you know, okay, gravitational waves. What are they? Well, they're essentially ripples in space-time. Um, they're caused by some sort of object or a violent collision of masses in the universe. The space-time in general relativity is curved. Some people have been asking me about this, that what Einstein has shown is that space-time is actually curved. And a heavy body would distort this curvature of space-time. It's similar to when you throw a stone or a ball into a pond and you get ripples going out. We've all done this as children, I think, that you, you, know, you see the ripples going out in the, um, from the pond. And what you're having by some heavy body is ripples in space-time radiating out. And unlike the ripples in a pond that die down as they approach, you know, after a certain amount, the ripples in space-time continue. So, if we, for instance, have two black holes, they're really, really massive. As they orbit one another, their orbit decreases until eventually they coalesce. And then they something violent happens, and then they settle down to another black hole. The orbiting of the black hole will distort the space-time and will cause gravitational radiation. And we get an even bigger burst of gravitational radiation as they coalesce. We'll be doing that. Um, when they coalesce, we get some sort of spike in the gravitational radiation produced, what's called a chirp. And then we get what's called the ring down as the violent event, of the two black holes merge and settle down into a subsequent black hole. And this is essentially what LIGO has detected LIGO is a massive ground-based interferometer specially built to detect gravitational radiation. And it's observed the merger from several black holes now and also from a neutron star binary. Um, I should say that I said that, you know, you can get gravitational radiation from a massive body distorting space-time. Now, the radiation comes at a certain frequency, and detectors have to be at that frequency to detect it. LIGO has been built to detect these sort of black hole mergers, or mergers of binaries, and they're at the frequency of LIGO. At some stage, we will be having a, um, a space-based gravitational wave detector called LISA, and that detects frequency, a different range of frequencies. And that could actually detect some of these primordial black hole things, if they exist. Um, I think I've covered that. Yeah, unfortunately, I couldn't steal the... Um, diagram of the black hole binaries going round each other. I'm really not very technolo technological. So let's understand this. 
What is the gravitational radiation of a binary? So let me define the total mass as M1 plus M2, the mass of the two individual black holes or individual components of the binary, and the reduced mass, M1, M2 over capital M. Now, what is gravitational radiation? Well, it carries the radiation off to infinity, otherwise we wouldn't have detected it, but that's a prediction anyway. Um, now, the luminosity of some radiation source is uh, the amplitude squared times 4 pi r squared. So the amplitude must scale at large distances as 1 over r so that we can carry the radiation off to infinity. And when we sit down and work it out, it has to be a quadrupole radiation. What's a quadrupole? You know what a monopole is? Monopole. Charge of the electron. So let me draw that as a point. And the elect charge, electric charge radiates in all directions, symmetrically. What's a dipole? What's a dipole? Sorry? Oh, yeah, could be. Yeah? The example I was going to give was a bar magnet. Because I think, you, I think you do this in the laboratory. So if I have a bar magnet, north pole, south pole, so what do we have? We have field lines. And that's a dipole. And of course, I could have a dipole from, um, as you said, two charges. Um, that would give me a, a dipole. So a quadrupole is four. Quad. Um, we can imagine it as being I of subscript IJ, some rho, Ri, Rj, d cubed x. And typically, this would have dimensions of mass times r squared. Um, now, the indices in gravitation run over 0 for time 1, 2, 3. So I, I, J is a matrix. It is a four by four matrix. Like that. I'm not putting all the entries in, you can. Okay, four by four. That has 16 components. Blimey, that's a lot. But we can use symmetry principles here to relate them. So we actually want this to be traceless which means that these diagonal elements have to sum to zero. And we set 
symmetry conditions on this um, and what's called a gauge condition, which extracts some uh, um, spurious degree of freedom. And we're left with four non-zero components. But only two of them are independent. So what we end up getting is this. And traceless says that I y y is equal to minus I x x. So what we're left with is the two independent components of the amplitude of the gravitational wave amplitude which we call h as h x x h x y and there's a minus sign missing there so that should be minus I'm sorry about that. And this is sometimes written as H T sub, superscript T T, where this stands for transverse, i.e. transverse to the direction of motion, as Nabil was saying, and the other T stands for traceless. Oh dear, what a sign. Why is the minus sign missing? Okay. So what happens when a gravitational wave um, propagates? I mean, what we're finding, because it's, we've got two independent components, these are what's called two polarization states of the gravitational wave. I think you know about electromagnetic polarization. And, you know, one knows about this even in real life. Um, so, let me consider a ring of particles. Here I've got a circle of particles, three particles in the z direction. And let me send in, I'm always doing this, sending it the wrong way. Let me send in a gravitational wave with hxx non-zero and hy zero. This will distort the, part, the motion of the particles in one direction, and it's very similar to Nabil's oscillations that he was having on the string. I didn't know this, by the way. So it would distort the ring of particles like this. And, but if I were to send the beam of particles in, the radiation in with H, x, x, zero, h, x, y, non-zero, it would be distorted in a different direction. So the effect that this has on, on the wave is it distorts things depending on the polarization states. We can do a little bit better than that because we can start to see what would happen to our detectors. What happens when a gravitational wave passes through a bar? Now, really, we need to sit down and solve Einstein equations, which would take about 16 lectures um, to set up and then solve, or maybe 24, I'm not quite sure. But let me give you a heuristic argument. And one of you or two of you can tell me if I've got the uh, C's in the right place. I, I've tried to put C back. 
So let me define u as ct minus z and v as ct plus z. Now, ds squared was minus c squared t, dt squared plus 3 vector dx squared. I can rewrite that in terms of u and v, and it's minus du dv plus dx squared dy squared. Now, let's try. Well, this is very linear. That's a very linear solution. And, and general relativity, gravitation is non-linear. So let me try to make this slightly non-linear. Let me introduce some function here. S squared of u, c squared of u. I could make this more general, but this shows the point. And now I want to solve the most general vacuum equation. The most general vacuum equation for those two quantities, f and g, here you have to believe me, is f double dot over f plus g double dot over g is zero. Actually, that, that sort of looks familiar, doesn't it? We've seen equations like that before. Anyway, how do we solve this? Well, we could choose a function of g, choose g to be something, plug it into that equation, and solve for f. And by the way, the dot is with respect to u, because f and g are functions of u. So let me choose something arbitrary for g and then solve for f. And let me assume that g is about unity. So I'm going to write this as 1 plus epsilon of u, where I'm taking epsilon to be some small quantity. Plug this in, and you find that f is 1 minus epsilon. And then if you actually sit down and do this in your notebook, you'll find that there's a corrections to this of order epsilon squared. And I've dropped those order epsilon squared corrections because if epsilon is small, epsilon squared is tiny. So this is a good solution. In other words, when the gravitational wave passes through the bar, it is stretched in one direction, the g direction, and compressed in the other direction, the, so stretched in the g, com compressed in the f direction. And that's exactly what we would find if we were to solve the GR equations. And that's exactly what we actually saw. So this is LIGO. It's an interferometer consisting of two arms, 42 kilometer long arms, arranged at an L shape, 90 degrees. Um, these act as antennae for gravitational waves. They're based in the United States, one at Hanford and one at um, Livingston. And they are thousands of miles apart because the United States is a rather big country. And I realize I have not put down the distance. We now have a third interferometer called Virgo, and this is the same design, and it's in Italy. Um, the first gravitational waves that, you, that were detected were just detected with LIGO, and it meant that we had an approximate patch of the sky for the event, but we, didn't, we couldn't pinpoint it. When we have three detectors, we can triangulate that 
patch of sky so we get a more accurate um, area to look in. And this became important at the end. So here's our interferometer. What we have is a laser shining light onto a beam splitter. And the light goes down the two arms and is reflected back to the beam splitter. And some is going to a detector and some goes back that way. And we, de we detect the interference patterns at our detector. If the way it's designed, in a steady state situation, our detector will detect destructive interference. And constructive interference goes that way. If a gravitational wave passes through our source, our arms, then one arm will be stretched, one arm will be compressed, and so the light travels different um, lengths. So when it recombines, the interference pattern at our photodetector has changed. And that's LIGO. So, I believe I've just said this. So it stretches with one arm and compresses the other by an amount, um, delta L, changing the interference pattern. Yeah. And in practice, gravitational waves change the length of the LIGO detector, 42 kilometers, by 10 to the minus 8 meters. Tiny, right? But detectable. So, the first event I think you know was announced in, hello, It's a bit more complicated than that. We have to sort of work it out. But yes, essentially, that, that's the sort of idea that you send two waves down and you detect them. But it is a bit more complicated. I think there's another one further back. I mean, I might not get too far today. Uh, so 10 to the minus 18 meter, is much smaller than the wavelength of light, right? So how can it be detected? Well, the way the detector is a um, is a bar is, is this um, the detector is this uh, uh, this metallic rod, um, and we're detecting it with laser light, and I've no idea what wavelength of laser light they used. But it, like it's it's even much smaller than X-ray light, no? Like I think. I yeah, um, I don't know. Okay, it was, thanks. It was detected. So I mean, it, it, it's tiny, but I think that you can it, that while it's smaller than the wavelength, if you wait long enough, the noise averages out. So I think that has to do with it. You yeah. Oh, to, oh sorry. Know. Yes. Yeah. So. Yeah, because it bounces back and forth. Yeah. Exactly. So it adds up. Yeah. Oh, oh yeah. I'm sorry. Yes. Um, in LIGO. In our interferometer, it, it bounces back and forth from our um, in these um, the, these there's two mirrors here, and it bounces back and forth in these before it goes to the beam splitter, and I don't know how many times it bounces. I'm sorry. Um, so we detected this gravitational wave in. LIGO in September 2015. Then they had a few more, actually. Um, the first one was a brilliant signal 
and they deduced it was mass, uh, two black holes merging, one with mass 29 solar masses and the other of 36 solar masses. And essentially five solar masses was given off to, um, to create, oh, less than that actually. And the resultant black hole was 62 solar mass, so that's um, three solar mass of radiation given off. Um, and it was about 1.3 billion light years away. So the signal that they saw was this. And this is um, Hanford and Livingston. Um, they saw them essentially concurrently. Not quite, but almost. So here, the black holes are orbiting each other very, very close. We, only dis we can only detect the radiation when they're really very close. They're already inside the um, innermost, the ISCO, innermost stable circular orbit, when, when we start to pick anything up. And this is the chirp. And now we've got what's called the ring down as we settle down to the 62 solar mass black hole. And how they just, they detected the frequency in hertz from the two machines. And you, I think you can see by eye that the patterns look really quite similar in from both the two detectors. Um, hello. Do you want to get the thing over there? How did they know the solar mass of each black hole from the detected radiation? Um, so when you start to pick up the gravitational radiation as they're orbiting each other. I mean, very, very close. So from the, from the frequency and the amplitude of the radiation, you can figure out the individual masses. It's quite technical how you do that. But um, have you done normal modes? No. Um, you can start to do it on a couple of transparencies next, actually. Um, if you analyze the amplitude of the wave you get, you can write it down in terms of the total mass and the reduced mass. So you can start to deduce the, the, the masses from that. And the chirp depends on both the total mass and the reduced mass. So that's how you do it. Um, in practice, you have to take the Einstein equations and, I mean, you need a very large piece of paper. Actually, you need, a, you need, um, you need to use something called Mathematica to solve the equations. But you can solve them analytically. Um, when you want to look at the actual merger, that's only, you can only do that so far with numerical relativity. So, Truk's question was quite timely because I'm going to try to estimate this. I can't do it properly, but I can make an attempt. So, the amplitude is dimensionless. Um, it must depend on time. So it must go something like Newton's constant, mass of the bodies, um, R squared, uh, d2 by dt squared, this thing. And these are just there for dimensions. So I've already introduced M, 
cap M as M1 plus M2, mu as M1, M2 over cap M, the total mass and the reduced mass. So for a circular orbit, if the semi-major axis is A, then this becomes G C4 over R mu M over A, approximately. And D2 by DT squared is the orbital angular, proportional to the orbital angular frequency, which in itself is proportional to the mass. Omega squared A cubed is M, and M R squared is about mu A squared. So plug that in to get that formula. And now the frequency of the wave is the square root of m over r cubed. Plugging this in, we start to get an amplitude in terms of mu and the mass to the two-thirds, the total mass to the two-thirds power and the frequency to the two-thirds power. So what you do is you define, because that's the way it works out, the mass of the chirp. And the chirp, is, as it sort of goes through, to be mu m to the two-thirds, and this is written down as m to the five-thirds, the mass of the chirp. So that is the chirp mass. Then you put in all the missing factors, and this is the actual formula for the amplitude of the gravitational waves. So we've got the chirp mass, and we measure this. We can measure this. I can't, but it can be measured from this signal. So in answer to the question, that gives me the combination of reduced mass and total mass from which I can work out the individual masses. And it gives me the frequency of the gravitational wave. So I've got everything there. We can detect it. And we do. And it's amazing. So here we go. Here they go orbiting big chirp coming from here and the frequency of the chirp and then we settle down to the ring, ring down. Okay. Now LIGO has seen more than that. They saw the merger of two neutron stars and this was so fortuitous. They just switched on Virgo. It was just working properly and coordinating with the two LIGO detectors when they saw a gravitational wave radiation coming. And they told every optical telescope in the world within, um, it's all automated. So within a few seconds, every um, optical detector knew that LIGO Virgo had just seen something and they were all pointing at that patch of sky. Because we had the three um, detectors now detecting gravitational radiation, they could pinpoint the patch of sky that it was coming through, just triangulating up to a quite a small um, area. And um, an optical telescope, Fermilat, which was actually pointing there anyway, detected a gamma ray burst. The gamma ray burst was detected 1.7 seconds after the gravitational wave signal. Um, so what you can do from this, and knowing the distance that they'd pinpointed, you can now say, what's the speed of gravitational wa waves? And what you deduce from that 
is that the speed of gravitational waves is that of light to one part in 10 to the minus 15. If the speed of gravitational waves is the speed of light to one part in 10 to the 15, I think, and everybody else seems to think, they're equal. And if they're equal, if they're strictly equal, what this also means is that the particle associated with gravitational waves, let me call this graviton, has zero mass. In the same way that you talk about the photon being, being the particle of electromagnetic waves, we can say a graviton is the particle of gravitational waves. The photon has zero mass, now the graviton has zero mass. Actually, Einstein wrote his equations down as having zero mass, graviton. But some of us have played with cosmological models where, called massive gravity, where they may not have zero mass, but they might be a tiny mass, but not strictly zero. And what we now know is that there's a very strong constraint on such models. Some of these models have been used actually to try to understand dark energy. So now we've got a more restrictive set of models for dark energy. So we're coming back to cosmology that this neutron star merger has now had implications for cosmology. And it's great, it's great fun. And I have a sneaky suspicion that that's my last transparency. Yes. Um, you check from gas? No, thanks. Uh, I want to ask if the gravitational wave uh, could be affected by uh, stars and other astronomical objects by its way to the Earth. Ah, uh, yes. Because, yes, because um, any gravitational object would distort the space-time. So now, the answer lead me to ask um, how we deal with um, oh, the detected um, wavelength, and um, we deal it's for only for the uh, black holes, and sure. we use use them to analyze and to know the mass of black holes, and we actually know it's affected by others. Okay, now the. What we've detected is the gravitational radiation coming from a pretty violent event of two black holes merging. What we have not seen is the gravitational radiation from an arbitrary um, event, an arbitrary object. So, for example, in the centre of our galaxy, we have Sagittarius A, a 10 to the 6 solar mass black hole. Orbiting around that black hole are various stars. We cannot see the gravitational radiation coming from that, 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 those stars orbiting, although it's there. And that's because the frequency, the amplitude is too small. So the, the amplitude, you know, um, I didn't emphasize this, I'm sorry, I should have done. Um, somewhere or other, um, Here we've got the, um, actually, I've probably got it here, haven't I? So, we've got this coming, a massive factor of Newton's constant, the, the frequency and the chirp mass. Now, going as 1 over r, this, this has to be, you have to have a pretty massive event for us to detect it. And it's got to be at the right frequency for our detectors. So, you know, yes, in principle, um, 
if that gravitational radiation passed near, say, Sagittarius A, then you know, there would be some distortion, but it would be so small that we couldn't detect it in the same way that we don't detect any, we haven't, we haven't managed yet to detect the, any gravitational radiation from the um, stuff orbiting our black hole, or um, M87 either come to that. Now, if another black hole collided with our black hole, we would see it. I mean, they, uh, Lego would see it, sorry. I don't know, have I answered your question? So a question from Gaza. Let me try to repeat it for everyone. Hello. Oh, it's frozen again. They're having a particularly bad time with the power today, I think. Gosh. It must be so frustrating. Uh, hello. Hello. Thank you. Um, I have three questions. So, shall I ask them to you? Yeah. Gone. So I, think, uh, I think what I'll suggest is that we will have a discussion session after this. Maybe, like yesterday, I took um, the Gaza thing one on one. Um, okay. Maybe we could give you to take Gaza one on one, and I'll take uh, real life questions for a little while. Um, does that work? So I think this is not going to work. Actually, I don't think it's going to work. Yeah, yeah. I think it's going to work. It's, um, I mean, they told me that they have problems with the main computer today. So I think this is on someone's phone or something. So. Oh. Okay. Um, are there any any last questions from from here? Um, okay. Uh, we've heard several from you. So if there's any other questions, then I'll give them priority. But if not, uh, I am happy. We are happy. Um, okay. Here you go. Okay. Why we consider gravity as particles, not as a field? You've done quantum mechanics, haven't you? No. You haven't done quantum mechanics? No, uh, but uh, okay. very simple. There's a wave-particle duality. Mm -hmm. I can write down the wavelength of a particle of a certain mass. And for every field, I can assign a particle. Mm -hmm. So you're happy with me talking of photons? Yeah. But you know a photon Photo is that this, is, this describes an electromagnetic wave. Mm -hmm. So why not a graviton and a gravitational wave? Mm -hmm. I mean, for every... Um, we could sit down and we could calculate the wavelength, the de it's called the de Broglie wavelength of a particle of mass m. Uh, ooh, let's say that mass. <laughs> it wouldn't really make sense because that's quite heavy in terms of um, 
<laughs> fundamental particles, but you know, we can we can do it. We've got all the ingredients. We need Planck's constant. It's all we and the speed of light, that's all we need. Okay. I think C comes in. Okay, then yeah. photons. Why we are consider them as a particle, not as a pulses of electromagnetic because waves? Because when I quantize it, when I actually write, write down the quantum theory, I as assign a field, it's a vector field, to, the, um, to electromagnetism. And to a vector field, I would assign a particle. So particles, we can imagine them as uh, a quantum, a quanta of something, not as a, a ball of something. Yes, okay. a quanta. Mm -hmm. It's got a wavelength. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. So, um, uh, in the interest of advertising, I'll say that tomorrow's lecture, I will discuss this at a much more length, like the, the, the particle, what exactly it means to have the, the polarization of the, the graviton as a particle. So uh, hang on to the question. Yeah, that's all I'm saying. That's okay. it, give him a hard yeah. time. Exactly, yes, you can, you can harass right. me. <laughs> you can harass me about it tomorrow. Uh, any last questions? Um, in that case, let's thank Anne once again for her wonderful lecture series. Okay, so let me tell you the schedule from now on. We'll take about a 10 minute break, and then uh, we will hang around outside. I think we'll have another informal discussion session like we did yesterday. So we'll hang around outside. You can ask us questions about anything you like, including the problems. I remind you all that your homework, uh, your homework is, uh, is due in the evening today, so make sure you get it to us before the end of the school today. And um, that's all. And after the discussion session, lunch will appear, and we'll just smoothly segue into lunch. Okay? All right. Thank you, everybody.
Jeanette every time. But um, we're winning in the battle, I think. But um, just to say a few words, um, the, the homeworks are due again at the end of the day today. Uh, many people have asked me when exactly they're due, like is it 4.30 or 4.45? And I think to that I would say that just hand in what you have at, at the end. It, it's okay if you didn't make it all the way through every problem. This is totally fine. We're just, these are designed to make you think. They're not, you know, we, we don't want to stress you out about it, okay? So just hand in what you have at the end of the day today. That, that's totally fine, okay? Okay, and now we start the actual session. So um, this is a session on opportunities in academia. What we're gonna do is cover a lot of random, a lot of topics that might be relevant if you want to pursue a PhD in uh, Europe or the US. And actually a lot of this stuff is relevant to even outside Europe or the US, but because Hannah and I, our backgrounds are in Europe and the US, the most accurate stuff that we'll say will be about there. So we'll discuss a few things about how you get funding for a PhD. We'll discuss a few specific opportunities. And we will also discuss some practical details, like writing a CV, writing a cover letter, and writing an academic email, a formal email. And then uh, after that, we'll take a short break. In that short break, um, we mentioned that if you, any of you have a CV or a cover letter you want us to look at, feel free to bring it to us, and we'll take a look at it and discuss it with you, OK? OK, so let's get started. The first topic is, uh, is me, and I'll be telling you what do I need to start a PhD in Europe or the US. This is some hopefully useful advice. Okay, so the first thing to understand about a PhD is that you do not need to bring your own funds for a PhD. Almost all European and North American PhD programs come with funding, so the challenge isn't finding funding so much as it is getting into the program. Okay. Okay. And often, teaching is the way you will fund your PhD. Particularly in the US, most PhD programs last for quite a while. They last for four or five years, five, six years. And for a lot of that time, you will be a TA. You will grade problem sets. You will help out in labs and things like that. And that is how you will actually pay for your PhD. Okay. So by the way, Hannah, if I say anything that really doesn't apply to a PhD in the UK, can you correct me? Because I'm going to speak mostly about my US experience. So. Yeah, normally in the UK you don't um, have to teach to earn your scholarship. It really depends. Some PhDs you do have to teach and some you don't. Um, it really varies depending on the subject and the place that you go to. Um, but the other thing in the UK as well is that you don't have to sort of pay tax and stuff like that, whereas in Germany you do, I believe. So it really varies from country to country, but the main message is that to do a PhD, you can and probably should get money for it. Otherwise, don't do that PhD if <laughs> you're going to have to pay for it yourself. Yeah, excellent. So here are a few practical details about applying. So um, obviously, to start a PhD program, you have to apply. A thing to emphasize is that it is really a long process. It takes quite a while to do the whole thing. So you should have this on your agenda. If you do want to not, if you want to start one immediately after your master's. Um, you really need to start pretty much a year before you finish your master. Okay, maybe a year is a bit much, but you should keep this on your on your radar. Be aware of the deadlines well before you start thinking about the process. Okay, so if you're interested in it, towards the end of your undergraduate, before even looking at the masters, take a look at the deadlines for the places you want to apply to. Okay, all right. So now, first PhD is in the U.S. Um, you might have questions about PhD programs. It is totally fine to send an email to professors and ask questions. Uh, on behalf of faculty, we're typically very happy to get emails from students who are interested. We don't always reply immediately, but we'll direct you to the right information. Uh, and the Nabil there means that I will talk about how to write an email shortly, and maybe you can refer back to that if you have any questions. Typically, you need a CV, a motivation letter, and uh, three, two to three recommendation letters. Okay, So we'll discuss more of the details on writing the CV and the motivation letter. The recommendation letters are actually extremely important because they really give a picture of you as a, as a candidate. You should get recommendation letters from people, ideally, who know you quite well, okay? who can say nice things about you and really say special things about you that set you apart from other applicants. So try to you know, find people who will write you good recommendation letters that really set you apart. You don't want the generic recommendation letter. You will have to prove your English proficiency by taking a test. 
These are called the TOEFL or the IELTS. I think you probably know about these already. Um, and also in physics in the US, you need to take the physics GRE, the graduate record examination. This thing is actually kind of, um, okay, this depends on you, but when I took this, I found this test actually kind of hard. But I want to stress that it actually is also important because um, if you spend time on the GRE, it's, it's many, many very, very short questions. If you spend time studying for it, it's possible for anyone to improve their score dramatically. And a good score is really a way to set your application apart from other applications. So if you're serious about a PhD in the US, I encourage you to take this seriously, even though it's pretty boring. Okay, I'll warn you, studying for the GRE is pretty boring. But the goal isn't to learn interesting physics for it. The goal is just to do well on this test so your application looks good. Okay. And um, here is some contact information about where you can take the GRE in Ramallah. I confess, this is from a thing that Mario Martone made about three years ago. I'm not 100% certain this information is still correct, and I apologize for that. But it, it may be. Does anyone know where the GRE is in Ramallah now? Is it still good? OK, thank you. So the application deadline to start in October of 2020 is, or September of 2020, is between the middle of the December of 2019 and the middle of January 2020. So here, for example, is the thing from the Cornell Department of Physics. You can see right here, you have to get the application by December 15th, and this is to start in the fall of the next year. So this is what we mean, it takes a long time. So think about it well in advance, okay? Okay, next we turn to PhDs in the UK. So Hannah, please correct me if and when I say something wrong. This was not written by someone who knew about PhDs in the UK. Okay, again, it's fine to send an email to professors and ask questions. This stuff is pretty much the same. Uh, you need to take an English proficiency test. Do you want to say a few words, Hannah? Usually it's just two recommendation letters in the UK, so that's slightly easier. I okay, guess. that's good. All right, that's slightly easier. And um, you need the TOEFL or the IELTS still, and I think... Yeah, the deadlines here vary, is that correct? Yeah, Yeah, it could be anywhere between, I think Oxbridge is quite early, it's like October, November. And then um, other universities are as late as February, March. So it really depends um, on the institution. But yeah, m just check the deadlines and make sure, it takes a really long time to prepare all of these as well. Um, you know, weeks at least to, to really refine it, ask for help, compare with your friends, make sure that it's really good. So prepare. But you asked those questions about the UK. Yeah. Um, most of the scholarships we have in the UK for doing PhDs are coming from so-called research councils. And it's hard for an overseas student to get one because when usually we're allowed to give them currently for UK and EU students, but not, I mean, there, there are some opportunities for students from outside the EU, but they are more limited. And for instance, in my own university, Cambridge, that we have some private money called the Cambridge Overseas Trust, which you can apply for. Um, I don't know how many scholarships they give, and there's also a Gates scholarship, but there are funding, I'm afraid the actual UK funding for PhDs is more limited for people from outside the EU. And uh, I'll, I'll second that. It's exactly the same situation in my university in the UK. It's, um, it's quite difficult, so this is just something to be aware of. Okay, um, so moving on. So um, now here's some still words about PhDs in the EU. So of course there are PhD scholarships offered in many European countries. The process might vary. And uh, we don't want to say any blanket things because it seems to us that it's quite different in different countries. So again, you know, just Google, f look around and find these things. And um, again, we emphasize that it's fine to send emails to professors and ask questions about the process. Okay. And uh, the time span is roughly the same. I believe deadlines are very similar in the UK and, and in Europe. Okay. So uh, now I'm going to talk about some specific examples. So actually, um, this is, these are not PhD programs we're talking about now. We're going to talk about how to do, for example, a master's. We're going to draw to your attention two specific master's programs because these are specific to Palestinian students. 
And um, the ones we're going to talk about, there's one of them at my institute, Durham, and there's one at Hannah's old institute, um, St. Andrews. And this is just a coincidence that they happen to be at our places, I think. So um, the way these things work are, these are open to only Palestinian students to do masters in these two institutions, okay? The Durham one is called the Durham Palestine Educational Trust, and the one in St. Andrews in Scotland is called the St. Andrews Education for Palestinian Students. And um, these are nice opportunities. You can apply for them. They're open only to Palestinian students and also open to them who, students who have not previously done a master's. If you've done a master's already, you can't do another one with this. But if you're approaching your final, the final end of your undergraduate, I really encourage you to think about this because I think this is a great opportunity. And um, I, I'm in contact with the people who run this. They're always looking for talented students and they strongly encourage me to tell all of you about it and make sure everyone is aware of this opportunity. And um, what else should I say? You need two references. And maybe this is an important thing. In parallel to applying to this, you have to apply to the university and you have to get accepted to the university to be considered for these things. Okay. Is there anything I'm forgetting, Hannah? Yeah, just a slight thing. You can currently be studying a master's and then a, as long as you're currently still doing the master's, you can apply, at least in St. Andrews, um, to then do another one. Oh, um, okay. At least from the text that I copied, it says must be studying oh, very good. at the time, for even if it's a postgraduate. So, okay. I think yeah, it's okay. Some I think ICTP do a similar thing as well, where even if you're currently already doing a master's, you can apply to do another one. Okay. So given that information, I'm suddenly nervous about what I said about Durham. So so check and make absolutely certain. I may have misunderstood what I what I read from there, but check and see if you're eligible. I think these are very good opportunities, and they're always looking for good students. I think both of them take roughly one to two students a year, but across all disciplines. So you'll be competing with people in all different fields. Okay. And another similar master's that I completely just remembered now, there's something called Erasmus Mundus, and they have a lot of funding for international students. So um, you would be competing against people from other countries, but they have a lot of funding and it's for a specific course that you're interested in and they have lots of ones, different ones that are related to specific physics topics and you get all of the funding um, included with that. So this is obviously a lot of information. From Scientists for Palestine, we try to collect all of this on our website. So if you go to our website, we have a list of resources for funding which you can take a look at. It's, it's quite long now, so there's lots of different opportunities like this. You can scroll through there. And also, if you are aware of something that is not on the list, tell us and we will add it to the list. So we're continuously adding to this list of resources. Okay. And um, I think that's probably it for, uh, yes, I think that's it for this. So now I'm gonna turn it over to Hannah. Uh, I'm not aware of the program at CESA actually. Could you please um, tell us about it? Um, I mean, my understanding is that ICTP and its co-institute, CESA, do have PhD opportunities, masters and PhD opportunities. So look at CESA, S-I-S-S-A, and ICTP. Because ICTP is specifically from students, from students and young researchers from, um, well, who don't have the opportunities in their home country. I'm tempted to say developing countries, but that sounds a bit rude. Um, but, you know, not, not countries like um, the UK. It's specifically for uh, parts of Asia, Africa, and countries where the opportunities are not there. So it's ICTP and SISSA. Both in Italy. It's a lovely country to live in. Okay. I don't really know much about CISA, but you know. Okay, so here is something about cover letters, which are really, 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 really important. Um, does everyone know what a cover letter is? 
No one knows what a cover letter is. Okay, so when you apply for something, um, you normally need a CV, you need your letters of recommendation, but then you also need to sort of describe a bit about a page, why you're actually interested in the position that you're applying for, um, and a bit about you and your background. So it should be about one page long. Um, and as I said before, it really does take a long time to write it and edit it and make sure that it's really good and really emphasizes your strengths. Um, and also, it should really convey why um, you're interested in applying for the p particular, say, course at that institution. Why there? Why this country? Um, how does that relate to you? And make sure that you highlight how it relates to them as well. Um, and also, yeah, just you want to show that you're really enthusiastic for what you're applying for. Maybe you want to say, in particular, name some of the, the professors at the institution and how you're really excited about the work that they're doing. Um, and really just kind of shine, and this is a really nice opportunity to shine. Um, so you would start by saying, dear professor, or dear doctor so-and-so. Um, or if you don't know who it is, you can just say, dear members of the selection committee. And then you want to go on and say explicitly, I'm applying for this role. Um, I found out about it either just via someone in particular from here, or maybe you found out about it from um, this school itself. And if you can mention anyone that maybe knows someone at that institution, that can also really help as well. Um, describe a bit about what you're currently doing. You're doing an undergrad, you're doing a master's. Um, what actually are you researching? Or what are you studying? What really excites you about what you're studying? And who are you working with? And just give also an information I expect to finish in December 2020 or whatever. Um, and yeah, why, why do you want to do physics? Why do you want to do, say, if you're applying for nuclear physics, why do you want to do that? Um, and, and how does your background relate to the role that you're applying for? And you could maybe describe a bit about what you see yourself doing in the future? Do you plan to continue, do a PhD, stay in academia? Um, or maybe you want to bring some of the things that you learn back here um, to work with other people. Maybe you want to network and make new collaborations. Um, and really, what can you offer to the place that you're going? So that could, for example, be like, say you've done a lot of outreach, you've been involved with NOVA, for example, or maybe another or organization, maybe you've even helped to set it up. Um, and things like that are really valuable to mention. And that suggests that you would really offer a lot to the place that you're going as well. And just end by, for example, saying you're really happy to discuss things in further detail and thank them for their time and consideration. Um, and just a few other points. This is really not a CV. Don't just list what you've already listed in your CV and talk about that. This is something very different. Um, and other things you might want to say is, yeah, you're from Palestine. Maybe they don't know the situation here. Explain that you don't have access to resources like other people do. Um, and that it's really important for you to may maybe get new skills and bring them back here and create new links with other countries and other partners. Um, and also, I would say, be very sincere. Um, don't say that you're the next Einstein and you're the best student that has ever existed in the universe. Um, be really realistic. Yes, okay, if you've, say, won an award saying that you're the best um, student of 2018 and you got the best grades, then that's great. Um, but don't over-exaggerate because it comes across slightly strange um, when you see these written down. 
Um, and also, yeah, ask for help. The best people, um, well, the best applications are the ones that have always been kind of edited and checked by other people. So make sure you really do that. Anything else? Okay. Oh, by the way, are there any questions? Oh. Is there any questions, of yeah. course, at any time? Wait, I can rotate. <laughs> okay. okay. Sorry, I just need to rotate once. Sorry, everyone. Um, <laughs> can you all see that? Yeah, okay. This is what not to do when writing a CD. Um. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> So while, while we watch these things rotate, um, can, how many people here are actually considering uh, doing a PhD? Um, okay, excellent. We're very happy to hear that. Okay. Very good. Yeah, yeah. Please, Anne, tell us what not to do while we continue rotating. I mean, you know, Hannah's emphasized what to say in the cover letter, and she's going to tell you what to say in your CV. Sometimes when you get applications, they tell you either in the cover letter or in the CV that they're active in the, um, well, you know, they're a church warden and they organize the Sunday school or they organize the, um, the lessons on Islam in the mosque or something like that. It's totally irrelevant to whether you're going to be doing a PhD in physics or not. So don't bother to put in your extracurricular activities. They're important to you, but they're not important to the person reading the letter. And when I read these letters, and it's got a whole paragraph on why I'm an interesting person and why I do this important work in the community and all this, I'm afraid my eyes glow, glaze over and I don't read it. At best. Thank you. Okay. Um, okay, CVs. Um, sorry, it's still not perfect, but it will do. <laughs> um, so in a CV, you want to summarize um, your background education and anything that's relevant to what you're applying for. Um, so if you, even if you're applying to, say, a master's in nuclear physics and a master's, say, in astrophysics, you would need possibly even two very separate cover letters and two slightly different CVs to really highlight things that are relevant to those opportunities. Um, you want to make sure that it's in a really nice layout. Um, if you have stuff all over the place, then it can be quite distracting and very difficult to see. And also, when people are looking at these applications, they might be looking at 200, 300. So if something is difficult to read, they're just going to throw it away. Um, so really make sure that it's, it's pleasing to the eye. Um, and you don't be afraid to highlight things in bold if they're really even more important than everything else. Um, and you don't have to write complete sentences. You can um, kind of think, keep things short and snappy and make sure that your spelling and grammar is correct. So again, even if that means, um, I think, do the scientists for Palestine offer any sort of help with just checking grammar and stuff or no? Um, uh, we, we don't do it systematically. It is something that we can talk about yeah, with the guidance yeah. thing. But informally, if you want, just send us an email and we'll do, yeah. we'll do what we can. Yeah. We don't promise, but we'll do what we can. Yeah. Um, and make sure it's not longer than two pages. Um, and you'll need to keep updating it as you go you know, throughout your academic life. Um, and yeah, also look at what's out there. Look up examples of a CV that's for a physics application for a master's. Um, and don't copy it, but <laughs> take ideas from that. And 
yeah, make sure that your, your name is obvious and how to contact you, where you're from. Um, and don't be afraid to say, clarify what your gender is and um, how you might pronounce your name. And yeah, make sure that in the education section that you start with your most current and you kind of go backwards in time as you go down. You'll see that in examples that you look up. Um, yeah, show what you're actually studying, who your supervisor is, what the title of your thesis is, and note any um, particular awards or honors that you've received um, and any relevant, so I think in a CV you can put extracurricular stuff, but only if it's relevant, say you set up a physics society um, or something like that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, and you can also list definitely that you came to this summer school um, and any other schools that you have been to and any experience that you have maybe doing a bit of teaching that doesn't have to be official teaching but maybe you sort of help supervise um, or worked with some younger students on their projects or things that you might have organized um, and uh, yeah, again, list any work experience you might have had. Again, only if it's kind of relevant. Um, nobody wants to see that you worked at, Mc at KFC or something like that. <laughs> um, and yeah, any languages. So again, you would list that you know English and that you have either the IELTS or the TEFL um, and list your experience in programming and I'm sure that you're learning Python so I would put that um, and so this is just an example of a very messy CV that is quite difficult to read um, and this could be improved by say doing something like this so this has been done in LaTeX and I'm um, it's not too difficult to learn and there are lots of tutorials online if you wanted to to use a LaTeX template like this, which makes sure that everything is neatly, neatly written and all um, looks quite good. Any questions or anything I've missed? No, okay. Oh, sorry. Thanks. I just wanted to say, as like someone from Germany, I know that many things of these do not apply apply to German stuff, for example. So, I think the there are many specifics for each single country, especially in Europe. It varies hugely. Like, a, a CV for a German university is different from a CV to a French university. So, if you apply, make sure this can all be found on the internet. So, make sure you do research on this. And for example, I know many professors they go crazy over extracurricular activities. They want you to like. You should write as many of them as you want, as you, as you can, and uh, in Germany. And uh, also other things, they vary. So it might even vary from uni to uni. Yeah, yeah, this is true. Um, if you can write to, if you know someone who's actually from that country and knows the system, mm -hmm. write to them and ask for help. Um, also, I just noticed that uh, one of the slides you were talking about grammars, uh, and there's something that I wish that I had known a long time ago. There's like a, a Google Chrome or even anything extension that you can download in your laptop, and it's called Grammarly, and it is so, so good. Like, it is really good. It's ba like it's based on really good machine learning algorithms, and it fixes your grammars when you're writing uh, something in Google, in Google Docs or in emails or anything. There's also one more thing that I, um, uh, for CV, it is it's also really, really good and important, I think, to have your CV in LinkedIn. Um, 
when you apply to so many places and you ju you can just give your, your LinkedIn profile um, and instead of just, uh, it's more formal and you can connect to so many people and you, there's a lot of people who find jobs in LinkedIn, so yeah. Yeah, that's definitely a good thing. That also made me think as well. Um, you should try and Google yourself. If you type your name, make sure that stuff that say all over your Facebook that someone that <laughs> is someone you might not want someone to see. Um, make sure that your online presence is is okay and you're happy with other complete strangers seeing it because a lot of people do just look people up on the internet um, to see a better idea of what they might be like. Okay, so thank you for all of that. Um, yeah. So next up is a very short presentation that I'm going to give on uh, how to write an academic email. So this might seem very technical, and I think many of you already know the things I'm going to say, but I think it's helpful to, to remind everybody how this works. So the, the basic thing here is when you're writing an email to a professor or something like that, they, uh, they don't know anything about you at all. So the full information that you're going to give them is sort of in this email, for example. So what that means is they will, in their mind, form an image of you based on this email, completely on this email. So that's why you want to make sure that emails like this are actually pretty nicely written so that the image that they form of you in their mind is, is accurate and complementary. Okay? So let me explain to you what I mean. So here's an example problem that you might have to solve. So you are a master student doing a thesis on gravitational waves, and you see this online. Here's an advertisement. Okay, so what does it say? There's a gravitational physics summer school in, uh, okay, I didn't update the year, but it's a gravitational physics summer school, and uh, it's at the University of Amsterdam. We'll have a summer school in gravitational physics. We welcome applications from PhD students or highly qualified master students, okay? Some limited travel grants will be available. Inquiries should be sent to someone here. Okay, so you see this and you think, ah, okay, I'm working on gravitational waves, I want to go to this school, but can I go? You know, there's some limited travel grants, will they fund my travel? Do I qualify for this? It seems like it's mostly for PhDs, but maybe I can go. You know, this is something you might be curious about. And it says inquiry should be sent to this professor. So, of course, you should sit down and write an email. Okay? So first, I'm going to give you an example of how not to write this email. Okay? I tried to make as many mistakes as I could in this email, all right? Okay, so here's an email. So, to, you get the address right, that's good. Okay, from physicsdude432 at gmail.com. Dear sir, I want to apply to summer school, but I still do masters. Okay, so, there are many problems with this. Let's talk about the problems. What are the problems? Someone. Sorry? Yeah, okay, there's many in the back there, yes. There's no subject. Yeah, I mean, the subject is question mark. That's horrible, okay. Uh, what else? What else? Yes. Yeah. Dear sir? Yeah, exactly. That's horrible. We'll explain in a second exactly how bad that is in this case, but that's a, that's a bad flag. Yes. Uh, the email doesn't have the name of the sender. That's right. That's horrible. Yes, exactly. That's terrible. Um, anything else? Anything else? Yeah. Not a formal language, exactly, it's terrible language, you know, the language is not formal at all. Anything else? Yes. There's no capital letters, there's no commas, you know, the grammar in general is horrible. There's one more thing, has anyone caught the uh, thing yet? Yeah. I still do masters. I still do masters, this is really ambiguous what this means, exactly, you know, it's not clear what the problem is. Okay, alright, so let's go through this, uh, I like some things myself. Here's something no one pointed out, so here's the first thing that would catch my eye actually. The email address is unprofessional, okay? So, you know, you, you might or might not be a physics dude, but it shouldn't be clear from your email. So I think you should make an email address. The best is to have a, a .edu email address. If you can't, write a, a boring one, like, you know, nabilikbal14 at gmail.com. Yes. Yeah, yeah, that's right, exactly, yes, you, sh you should, oh, sorry, sorry, I meant this was actually the email, yeah, because I, I confess that, yeah, this is not in impossible, yeah. So, um, exactly, so just make sure your email address is professional, use a professional email address as much as you can, okay, make it look like a nice email address. Okay, now most of these things people are caught, no useful subject, someone pointed that out. Dear sir, you know, the, the, it's all lowercase, but is sir correct? Well, it could be worse than that. If you Google Alejandra Castro, this is Professor Alejandra Castro. She's not a sir at all, okay? 
So this is an important thing, all right? So what you should do is, if you can, Google the person and check, you know, if you can figure out the gender. If you can't, you know, there's ways to write this email that do not refer to the gender, and you can really do that. I'll show you an example on the next thing, okay? But this is really bad, so you don't want to do that. Uh, let's see, what are some other mistakes? Uh, okay, the grammar is bad, the spelling is bad. There's like, for example, this, this summer is not spelled like that. The grammar is bad. And um, finally, overall, it just sounds rude. Um, there's no nice words at the beginning. There's no ending at all. And finally, it's just not even really clear what the email wants, okay? So this is obviously an extreme example, but I wanted to make every mistake that I could imagine in this thing, all right? Okay, now let me show you how a better way to write this. Okay, so from a Castro to the same person, from here, I have now made a professional email address. There's now a subject, okay, question about application to summer school. So it's clear what the email is about, what the subject is. Okay, so now here is a polite start, all right. It is bad to get the gender wrong. Uh, it's, it's sometimes a bit difficult to tell. So when I'm in doubt, what I normally do is I write prof, okay. And this is sort of good for many different things because um, like, oh, sometimes it's not clear if someone is really a professor, maybe they're just a doctor and not a professor yet and different countries have different conventions for this. But I feel that professor is a, is a fine thing to write. If you, you know, it's unlikely that you'll be causing, you'll be saying something rude. If someone is only a doctor, but you call them a professor, they'll be like, ah, oh, okay, nice. You know, they, they won't be upset about it, okay? So, um, so I think this is what I normally do when I can't tell, I write prof, okay? All right, so this is a polite start. And uh, now here is uh, the text of this. So this, this thing, uh, I mean, you know, there's, there's many ways to do this. But it's helpful to put a little bit of information about yourself, depending on, the, depending on the context. So I say that I'm in the second year of my master's at Blah Blah University. I'm working on a project of gravitational waves with Prof so-and-so. This is helpful in this case because the person is trying to tell, oh, do, you, do we really, this is, is this person a highly qualified master's student? You're making clear from this that I am a highly qualified master's student because I'm working with Prof so-and-so. And then you say what your question is. It's very clear, okay? There's good grammar and good spelling. The last time I gave this talk, I said that spelling, you see, there is no excuse for spelling mistakes because there is a spell check, okay? There should be no spelling mistakes in any email ever. I used to say that grammar is difficult, but apparently machine learning has solved this problem, and I've never used Grammarly, but um, it sounds like if it gets the job done, then that's good. You should pass it through something like that, or just pass it through someone, you know, show it to your friends and make sure they agree with your grammar. And finally, um, there is a closing thing. You know, I say this, this doesn't really have any information, but it's just polite. And finally, here's a closing thing, best regards, blah, blah, you know, university, you put your name, you can put this, you can put your phone number if you want. There is really very little chance anyone will call you on your phone number, but it shows that you're serious about it. If you put your phone number, you can think about doing that. None of these things are, are rigid, but they're just suggestions, okay? And you give lots of info about yourself. Okay, so here's the basic thing, the basic, let me just recap. The point is that the person you're writing to has no information about you. They will form an opinion of you based on the email, so everything counts. And um, use good grammar, use good capitalization, use good spelling, use spell check, pass it through things, and be polite. Spend some time on this if you're not sure about this. Just spend a little bit of time and make sure you do all these things. And finally, make sure your question or your request is clear. Okay? This is all mostly common sense, but I just want to encourage everyone to think about it. Okay, thank you. Any questions or comments? Okay. Okay. So, um, so the official session is now over. We'll take a short break before we reconvene um, in a few minutes, and um, we'll reconvene at um, in about 15 minutes. Let's reconvene yeah. at 3:15. And um, in the meantime, if you have a CV you want us to take a look at, feel free to bring it to us, and we can help you out with it or try to. Thank you.
There might be a question coming. Okay, okay. Uh, it's a question. Uh, my essay is written this way. Uh, hi, it's Mr. Brian. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, so This varies a lot between different countries, right? Yeah. So I don't know. Yeah. This and I need to the yeah. 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 It depends. Yeah. This depends. So is it normal in the if you find places here? Is it normal to go to your birthday? If it's normal, then you should probably go with that. Then. Yeah. This, this varies in every country, actually. So yeah. So I think one thing that's important is what Moritz mentioned, which is that you should listen to our advice, but then before you take it, make sure you agree with it, because a lot of these things vary in every country. So you shouldn't. If you heard this thing sounds crazy, don't don't do it. You know, we we, we might have it wrong for this country. So what I want to advise for something in university. Yeah. Okay. But what about my national? I think that is it. Okay, is it the right day to go? Uh, uh, after uh, my uh, achievement, uh, he had to throw it. Yeah, I would maybe put it at the top. Yeah. Uh, there? Yeah. 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 or even Microsoft Office. Okay. I think I would write under computer skills, I would write uh, programming in C++, Python. Okay. I think, I think would you agree that that includes information, assumes that you know Microsoft yeah, Office. Okay. That, that's what I would do. Okay. And, um, and maybe you talked about, so how do you feel about putting this at the beginning? Did you put that in the end? Or, um, okay. Hi, sorry, we're talking about CVs, if you'd like to join us. So we'll, we'll take your question in a second. Um, I can't hear you. Hello? Okay, hello? Yeah, now we can hear you. Yeah, sorry. It was my fault. Yes. Great. So we're talking about CVs now. So we'll take your question in a second, if that's okay. Okay. Yeah. So, um, but yeah, so basically, um, uh, sorry, guys. So, Yeah. So you put the most recent things first, and then you go down. Yeah. 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 Yeah
official. Uh, official. Uh, official. Uh, official. Uh, first course is 19. My, my own TV has first everything course. on the first course. Course. The reason yeah. is that when someone is in a hurry in reading it, they want to see the things that can be done more quickly oh. and not, you know, stuff that you live in your six years old. So my, you know, the mine goes all the way back and lists awards that I won when I was like an okay. undergraduate. Uh, it doesn't matter. Uh, you know. and, uh, is it right? Yeah, this is right. This is and right. then? Yeah, this is also correct, because these are all going back in time. However, your achievements are, are going forward in time, right? Uh, so I would say, I would say that you could do it. Yeah, would you say that? Okay. But, you know, again, if you make things tough, by any means, just don't do it. it, it these things vary from person to person. Okay, thanks. Yeah, can we, can we, um, yeah, let's make a quick live. We're talking to Gaza, I think, right now. Hello. Uh, Hi, is there a question? No. Activity. Activity. We, yes, we can. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I was here yesterday and I asked you a couple, a couple of questions about the flight for America. Yes, that's right. Yeah, yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so, yeah, uh, I'm in the phase of choosing the university and I'm kind of confused. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure the phase of what should I choose. Like, uh, I, and I'm here, like, uh, and thinking, uh, and thinking about things like uh, prestigious universities. Right, right, right. Yeah. So, based uh, on what shall I uh, pick the university, or at least make shortlist the university? Right. So I think this is this is difficult. There's no really good way to do it. I, I think what what most people do is they apply for a range. So apply for maybe like find find one that you think you that's maybe a little bit difficult to get into. Like find a, one or two top ones then apply to one or two middle ones, and then apply to one or two ones that are very much easier to get into. And um, you can usually figure out how these things work by talking to people. Like, for example, Harvard is very hard to get into. So if you, if you don't have a good GPA, think if you have a good chance of getting into Harvard, and if you really think that you don't, then, then either don't do it, or maybe only apply to, to Harvard and not to also so MIT and Princeton and Caltech. So you pick one of those that you, that you reach for. And then I think it's good to just have a range. Have a few ones in the middle that are medium, and have a few that are, that are easier to get into. So that's, that's what I did when I applied. I applied to a few really hard ones, a few medium ones, and a few really easy ones. And I think that was the right thing to do. In America, there's a problem that it's just very expensive as well. Every application. I don't know how much it costs now. How much does an application cost now? Like $100 or something? Yeah, mine participated in a program that would cover the Swedish Oh, okay. Okay, okay. So I, I think it's a little bit different in undergraduate applications and graduate applications. In undergraduate applications, they really care about that you're not boring and that you're cool and interesting. For graduate applications, I'm not sure it's as important. I mean, it's, it's always good to not be boring. I think you should always not be boring in life. But I don't know that there's any really good way to do this. In a personal statement, it's very difficult because, you know, you, know, you, um, you don't know that much of what you're going to say. I, if I were in your position, I would um, emphasize the, the fact that you're coming from Gaza and you're passionate about science. Uh, Explain the things that you've done and the things that you're interested in already. Of, uh, that already uh, will set you apart from everybody else because your background and ability to read. So I think if I were you, I would, I would yeah. emphasize that. But again, you should talk to many different people and, and, and ask them uh, what they think. This is very subjective. I don't want to say it like this is the right way to do this. You know, it's very subjective. I think you shouldn't worry that you don't really know that much about your field yet. Because that's normal. Everybody, everybody knows this. So you should just pretend you know a lot and you just claim that you're interested and explain why you're interested. That's okay. You can tell me this. I don't want to worry too much about it. I don't want to worry too much about it. Yeah. Uh, uh, so the, the general or the, speci the specialized one? 
Oh, it depends. Um, I see. Is it possible for you to take the physics? Oh, he's got it. Physics class. Is it possible? Take physics class. Yeah. Well, you should. You should. With whatever they require, you should take, of course. So I think they require both, right? Most what universities what require what both general and general. I think it might be difficult. So, if you can take it, it's good because um, I always encourage students from um, to, to take this because um, you see anyone can do very well in theory. You spend a lot of time studying for it. You're so good. So this is a very good way to make yourself stand out because you can get a very very good score in theory. And then if someone is reading a hundred applications, if you have a very high score, then immediately they will they will be their eye will be drawn to your application. So that's why I always encourage everyone to do this. But if you can't do it, then that's okay. You know, but you should really explain in your application why that you can't do it. Because it's not possible for anyone to take it this year, as far as I understand. So you should you should do that. In the general one, in physics, the English part is not that important. If you're studying like theory, if you get a good grade on it, that's great. But if you get a bad grade on it, it doesn't matter really. Because most, most of the yeah. English. Yeah, yeah, it's not, it's not relevant. Yeah, it's not relevant. You should get a very good grade on the math uh, general theory, but you will automatically. Yeah, you should get a good grade on that, I think. But, um, but that's not relevant. Do you think one of the most important uh, exams do you think like students who are young and young and young and young and young and this is very subjective, actually. So I think on the CV you can list it for sure. On the CV you can list it, and it's up to you whether or not to list it on other places. Like personal CV, it's up to you. I think that I don't know if you heard that other people were saying that this varies a lot based on university to university and person to person. So, you know, I think everyone will tell you their opinion. If it's me, I also, if I'm reading a cover letter, I don't really care. But when I'm reading a CV, if I see it, then I think, oh, okay. But it doesn't really affect my specific topic, right? So I'm a lot like Anne in this uh, specific topic. We're discussing with Gaza the importance of social activities. And I was saying that you know, I'm like you, is that uh, when I read this, I, I don't really care about the uh, yeah, no, yeah. So it's not good. Yeah. It's not good. Yeah. It's not good. I'm looking for the physics stuff. Yeah, 
Oh, don't do that. Don't bother. Don't bother with the weakness. Just the, just how important it is. No, I mean the thing is that that university is the one that's here to be handy. When you get when you get your degree, they'll ask for the transcript. So you can't cut it down. They just run it in, they print it. And Yeah. Oh, okay, that's I am. Yeah. 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 Ye
talk I've ever done. It's great, right? It's just I hope I don't kind of waffle. Okay, everyone, please have a seat. Can you hear me? Is the mic, is this okay? Okay, everyone, for the last talk of the day, we're very happy to have Hannah telling us about star clusters in the local universe. Okay, so I'm just going to talk a bit about the research that I've been doing for my PhD. Um, I am kind of in my final year now, so I've done about two and a half years, and I have one year left. Um, and actually, in the first year of my PhD, I was doing something quite different. I was doing radio astronomy, where I was looking at um, kind of star formation regions. And I, de I decided that radio astronomy wasn't really for me, um, and I prepared, preferred doing astronomy in the optical. Um, so after my first year, I actually switched and, and completely changed topics. So uh, that's also a possibility, depending on, on where you go. If, say, you didn't get on with your supervisor, or you just really didn't enjoy what you were doing, but you decide you felt that you enjoyed something else there are possibilities to switch what you're doing and that and that is definitely possible and i know other people that have done done similar things as well so stars and star clusters can we turn the lights off just cuz otherwise you can't see the pretty pictures so uh, star clusters can look very very different you have quite young star clusters, where there are very few stars, um, and they are maybe only a few sort of 100,000 years old. Whereas you can have very old and very ancient star clusters. They're called lobular clusters, and they formed actually almost um, in the very early universe. They're almost as old as the universe itself in the grand scheme of things. Um, and you might see clusters that are just forming out of the sort of natal cloud of dust and gas um, that all the stars have formed out from. And what's important about these is that all the stars have formed out of the same material. So all the stars um, should have the same chemistry. And they're all formed at the same time. So all the stars within a cluster will be of the same age. 
And this allows us to do some really important stellar physics. Um, but first of all, just to go into a bit more detail about the different types of clusters, this, for example, does anyone know what this is, apart from Sammy? <laughs> no? So the, it says the name right there. <laughs> it's the Pleiades. And um, I just realized that. And it's 150 million years old. And it's not very large. In total, it's about 800 solar masses. And in astronomy, um, as we've already heard about black holes and stuff, everything is always measured in terms of solar masses. Um, but as I already told you, open clusters are very young, and there's not very many stars. But that's not actually quite true. You can have maybe, say, a cluster that looks like this, um, which has very many more stars. Um, so say this one is about 5,000 solar masses. Um, and it's a bit older, 300 million years old, but it's still very young compared to the ancient globular clusters. So we can have larger open clusters. Um, but if they're young, we just call them open instead of globular. The terminology is quite confusing. When they made, um, when they decided what they would call objects, they had much limited observations. So as we've kind of gone on with time, we've realized that really there's um, a whole range of different types of objects, and it's not just as black and white as we thought it used to be. Um, so here um, we've got like one of the biggest globular clusters in the Milky Way. Um, 47 Tuck, and it's very large. So before we had about, say, 1,000 solar masses. Now we're talking 10 to the 5 solar masses. Um, and also another one in comparison. And a lot of these clusters are called NGC in front of them. And that's just a catalog that mostly um, William Herschel sort of helped come up with as he was doing lots of observations a few hundred years ago. And as I mentioned, the oldness of these globular clusters is very important. Um, we're going back really far in time to the beginning of the universe in the scheme of things. So here it says, yeah, they can be about 12 and a half billion years old. And some people would argue that they're even some of the oldest structures that formed. So by studying them, we can maybe have a better idea of what happened all that time ago. Now, this is, again, a different type of cluster, um, sort of an analog to these globular clusters, which are very old and very massive. But here we have something that's very massive, um, almost 10 to the 5 solar masses. But in fact, it's very, very young. It's only 1.5 million years old. So only recently, these types of objects were really discovered. Um, and they have confused everyone because they don't fit into the traditional picture that we had of star clusters. Um, so what can we actually learn? So I mentioned that maybe we can have a better idea of what happened in the universe over many billions of years. Um, and we can do that also by getting a better idea of the chemistry. Now, chemistry, um, which we also use the word metallicity. And what metallicity is, is if there are elements that are heavier than hydrogen and helium. So if something is very metal rich, that means that you have a lot of elements heavier than hydrogen and helium. In astronomy, basically everything is hydrogen and helium. So anything heavier than that, we just call it a metal, um, which can be a bit misleading. And this is a very important diagram in astronomy called the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram. Um, have any of you heard of it or seen of it before? A few people, yeah. So what this is, is if you take a star and you measure its temperature and you measure its brightness or its luminosity, um, you get this kind of diagram if you were to say make this plot of all the stars in the Milky Way, which Gaia has recently allowed us to do. And it's backwards in that temperature increases towards the left, um, and you have really bright objects at the top. So we have things like 
um, very small white dwarfs. They're very hot initially, um, but they're not very bright because they're so small in radius. Whereas you have these supergiants, but because they're so blown up and they're so puffy, they um, are much cooler. But because they're so huge, they're much, much brighter. And just as an example of how small a white dwarf star really is, um, this is the white, star, white dwarf down here compared to the sun. And here's an A-type star. So don't worry too much about what A and G means. It's just a way of classifying stars um, in astronomy. And here is an example of a red supergiant called Betelgeuse. And you might not be able to see, but these rings here are the orbits of the solar system objects. Like, so here we have Saturn around the very edge, and here we have Jupiter. This is a, an image taken with ALMA, which is a radio interferometer. And this really shows you just how big these stars are. Um, so Betelgeuse goes out to the orbit of Jupiter. Basically, if we were imagined that the sun was Betelgeuse, we would not exist because we'd be inside the star. Um, and similarly, here's another really cool image of Antares. And this image is the best image that we have of any star in the universe other than the sun. And this was done using the VLT, the Very Large Telescope, um, currently in Chile, uh, owned by the European Southern Observatory. And if you go even further from red supergiants, you also have blue supergiants, which are even bigger. And so R136A1 is currently the candidate for the largest star that we have ever seen or know about. And it's about 300 solar masses. So say, for example, this could be the sun, this thing here, is the biggest star that we know of. It's really mind-blowingly large. Um, and so an important thing to think about is the bigger the star is, the more massive it is, the shorter it will live. It will burn through its fuel much, much more quickly. So it lives for extremely short times compared to stars like our sun. And then even stars that are much smaller than the sun will live even far, far longer. Um, so you can probably try and derive this if you just have an understanding of how the luminosity relates to mass and some other important equations as well. Um, but we get something like this. So the more massive the star is, the much shorter it will live for. And so here, this is an HR diagram, the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram um, of the Pleiades. And what we see is just this line here but we don't see anything else. We don't see any of the white dwarfs. We don't see any of the supergiants. So what does that mean? That means that it is a very young cluster. The stars yet haven't left this region over here and kind of gone over to become supergiants as their fuel has burned out and they have um, then started getting a lot bigger and a lot puffier. So these stars are still all on the main sequence, they're still all burning hydrogen. Whereas if we look at a cluster like this, which is much older, a globular cluster, um, we can see that these are all kind of supergiants at the very top, um, whereas there is still kind of some of the, the smaller stars um, are still on the main sequence, they're still burning hydrogen. And what we can do in astronomy is because of this, we can work out how old a cluster is based on this turnoff here. So if we know that um, stars of a particular size or mass will eventually stop burning hydrogen at a certain time, and that's when they turn off, then we can work out the age of the cluster. And something interesting happened then when Hubble went into space, and that was um, in 1990. And Omega Centauri is not technically a globular cluster. We still kind of say that even though it's much more massive than a globular cluster, we think it's actually leftover 
from a dwarf galaxy that had all of its sort of outer gas and stuff stripped away. Um, but what they found was um, there are sort of these extra, extra lines coming off here. And that doesn't really make any sense. Everything should be the same age. Everything should be the same, so have the same chemistry. Why do we have these um, different sort of paths on the diagram? And then we looked even closer and found that actually it looks like there are almost, what, four, seven, seven different types of stars within the same cluster, which should have been born at the same time and out of the same material. And this has really puzzled astronomers for, yeah, more than 20 years now, trying to figure out how on earth could this be possible. Um, and they still don't have an explanation. A lot of theorists have come up with crazy ideas of how this might be possible, um, and none of them are really that plausible. So this just goes to show there are some, there are a lot of fundamental things that we don't really understand still. And this just emphasizes, um, I just thought this is quite a nice plot of, of the periodic table, but it demonstrates where all of the elements actually came from. So hydrogen and helium mostly come from the Big Bang, whereas everything else has mostly been synthesized either um, from supernova or merging neutron stars, um, exploding white dwarfs. There are lots of different methods from how to create these heavier elements other than hydrogen and helium. And understanding how this relates to the clusters and the sort of different amounts that we have of each element is really important. And astronomers then went to look at other clusters. Could they also find similarly multiple populations, so multiple different sort of strands within the HR diagram? And it became apparent that everything older than two giga years so that's two billion years, um, did have these multiple populations, whereas all of the clusters that were younger than two giga years do not. So there seems to be something happening at two giga years where, star, where the clusters suddenly start having different types of stars um, as compared to before, and still trying to figure out why that is. Um, Another thing that we can see in star clusters is looking at the dynamics and how that maybe perhaps relates to stellar evolution. So going back to globular clusters, this is what my research is actually on. Um, and <coughs> we define a globular cluster as being a spherical collection of stars. You have many, many stars, so gravity makes it uh, spherical. And they will also orbit around a galaxy. Um, whether it's the Milky Way or pretty much every other galaxy so far that we've seen also has clusters orbiting around it. And as you go towards the center of the cluster, they usually get more and more dense. And these clusters are very useful. They're ideal laboratories for doing kinematical studies um, because they're so simple. They're made out of the same population of stars and they formed out of the same gas. So we don't have too many sort of different things going on. Um, and this means that we can have a better understanding of say the original population of stars and um, how they've evolved over billions of years. And so what I've been doing for my research is actually looking in particular in the very centers of the, of the clusters and this is only really recently being able to be done because, um, I will, well, I'll explain that in a bit. Um, so here's an example of a cluster. And if you want to know the radial velocity of any star within that cluster, what do you do? You put a slit on it to get the spectra. And now, you have to make sure that there are no other objects in that slit that are going to contaminate your spectra. But that's going to be a problem, right? If you put the slit in the center here, you've got many, many stars. How are you going to get a spectra of just one star? 
so you're limited to really the stars only in the outer edges. And it's a very slow and long process. You're just doing one at a time, one star, one by one. But then we have a thing called multi-object spectroscopy. And maybe you can do a few stars in one go. But still, you're limited to the outer regions of the cluster. But now we have a thing called integral field units. And that basically allows us to put several sort of, sort of fibers right in the center. And we can get information from each one of these, say, hexagons. They work differently in different ways, depending on which instrument it is. But this is a general picture of how that works. So I can make an observation and get spectra from every one of those little hexagons, um, which is much more information than previously before. And this is an example of one of those integral field units, IFUs. This is MUSE, um, which is the best IFU out there right now, probably. Um, and it's, yeah, it's a crazy machine that really does some exceptional work and allows us to really study things in great detail than we've never been able to, be, to do before. Um, so just as an example, if every point is a spectra and it, you look, say, in a cube of space, then you have this whole data cube where each point is a spectra and you've got all the wavelengths going across it that way. So you could take a slice and look at a galaxy um, at this wavelength. You could get a, a different wavelength over here or um, towards the UV. Um, so you're getting, in a much more kind of rapid amount of time, um, a lot more information. And this is an example of Muse um, trying to look in the center of a galaxy uh, cluster. Um, but then we made it even better by adding adaptive optics. And now I remember Bieta talked a bit about adaptive optics. Um, so for example, because of the atmosphere, a star will look sort of wobbly, or any object, not just stars. Um, but what we can do is we can measure the turbulence of the air which is distorting the image, and if we can account for that and change the mirror almost simultaneously, we can correct for it and then make the image that we're looking at look almost as if there was no atmosphere. So if we put that in place, then this is the same image as that, but with adaptive optics. So we can really resolve individual stars. So here you've got, say, two bright stars close together. And you would have no idea that in this image there were two stars there. It only looks like one. So this is the instrument I've been using, which uses the same technology, but it's not Muse, which is extremely difficult to get access on because it's so competitive. Um, but this is still equally a good enough instrument for what I'm trying to do. And in some ways, it's better than Muse. It's got a longer wavelength, uh, wavelength coverage and um, ha has other advantages as well. This is an example of the data that I get. So again, not as um, beautiful as the data from Muse, but it's still enough to, to get reasonable results from. And so right here, we're really looking at the, at the centers of the clusters. Um, it's not so. It's not as possible for clusters that are further away, where you simply cannot cannot do that. Um, these are the clusters that I've been looking at. I've looked at 59 in total, and what this image shows is um, basically one of those typical images of a galaxy, well, of the Milky Way, and um, here's sort of the plane around zero, and then you've got the bulge in the center. So a lot of the clusters. Um, are located in the center, and you've got some coming out in the halo of the Milky Way as well. And importantly, so I've got this thing that says metallicity. So that's, as I mentioned before, you have um, elements that are heavier than hydrogen and helium. Um, and if you have something that's, say, yellow here, so that's zero. And if it's zero, that means it's the same metallicity as the sun. So here in the very center, we've got some clusters that have a metallicity that's similar to the sun. And these are very, very little studied. They've rarely been looked at because they're right in the center of the Milky Way. So 
So they're very difficult to look at. There's a lot of dust and gas in the way, which makes that hard to do. Um, whereas a lot of the clusters around the edges have been observed much in much more detail, simply because they're easier. But they're all very metal poor um, compared to the sun. So they're, that means that they're older. If they've got more hydrogen and more helium compared to the sun, then you have um, something that's, say, more original elements that you had billions of years ago in the universe. So that tells us that they are older objects, whereas these are probably a bit younger. And uh, so far I have about 1,600 radial velocities of um, stars over the whole 59 clusters. And because we've really looked at the centers, um, so this is just goes by distance from each cluster. Um, and this was in blue was the data that we had before that was previously accessible. Um, and in orange is the data that I have. Um, we've really kind of been able to add a lot more data points in the center of the clusters, which no other study has been able to do. Um, and this is an example of how I get a spectra out of the data cube. Um, a spectra will look something like this. This is quite a nice one. Most of the spectra don't look as nice as this. Um, and what I'm then able to do is work out the radial velocity just simply from the spectra. And if I have enough velocities of enough stars within a cluster, then I can work out the dynamical mass um, simply from using the virial theorem. Um, so from here, you can end up and you can try and derive that yourselves if you want. Um, and sigma here is basically the velocity dispersion or the standard deviation um, of the cluster. And that then allows you to get the mass. So what, why do we want the mass? We want the mass so that we can then, say, compare it to the light and do what we call is a mass to light ratio. Um, this is an example of how we get the mass um, using one technique, which is just using n-body models. So here we plotted all of the velocity dispersions that we get at different distances out from the cluster. And the best fit then gives us the velocity dispersion that we then use to calculate the mass. Um, so the mass to light ratio is a way of seeing um, really how many high mass stars there are, how many low mass stars. So it's not going to be just one because the, the much bigger stars have a lot, much more light, um, whereas there are very few of the more massive stars, whereas you've got lots and lots and lots and lots of really small stars. However, they barely have that much light. So we expect that it's going to be different than just one. And when we determine the mass to light ratio, this is really used for calculating masses of, say, other galaxies, um, which are too far away to really do any proper dynamical um, work on that. But the main problem is, is that when we predict what the mass to light ratio should be, um, which is this line here, this is a theoretical prediction of the mass to light ratio um, going in increasing metallicity. So here at zero, we have solar, as I said before. And here are the metal poor clusters to the left. Um, and in gray are clusters from the galaxy Andromeda, whereas in black are clusters from the Milky Way. And they found that this line really doesn't represent the data especially when you go to around solar metallicities. Um, some other people then did some more work on this and found that, again, um, these are Milky Way clusters and they kind of remains flat, whereas these look like they're going up and that maybe there's some diversion here. And this is the data that I have. So previously, this kind of only goes up to about minus 0.5, whereas I've kind of extended the data set to about zero, 
and it's really obvious here that there is some discrepancy happening. So, where does it come from? We don't really know. Um, I tested a few different things. So, for example, we assume that all of these clusters are the same. They're of the same age. Um, they're the same sort of size. They um, are the same dynamically, but that's really not true. They're as I said, the, the clusters that are more like the sun are probably younger, whereas these clusters are much older. Um, and there are other things like remnants. So remnants are, say, neutron stars or black holes. And what happens, because they're so massive, they interact with other objects. And when they become so dense in the center, if you have enough of these objects, they might end up interacting with something and flying away out of the cluster. So if you get rid of enough of, these, uh, enough of these remnants, then you can end up with cluster with lower masses. And maybe this happens more at this end, which would bring this line down a little bit. There could also be other things more related to the dynamics. So what if, for example, these clusters rotate differently to these ones? Um, what if where they're located, you have some clusters that are located in the bulge um, or close to the plane. So there you're going to have much more tidal interactions than if you're further away out in the halo. So just to conclude, star clusters are really useful, but we have to be careful. Um, we know that we're about right here with our theoretical predictions. Um, and what we observe, but here we're way off. So in the past, well, and also currently, astronomers are assuming that we've got this theory right, but it really uh, is not the case, and we have to be more careful. Thank you. That is all I have to say. Any questions? You can also ask me just like general PhD stuff as well if you want. Hello. Uh, I want to ask you if there is any uh, try to use artificial intelligence in uh, analyze uh, like pictures of clusters which are full of stars. Yeah, so machine learning is becoming much more common in astronomy. It's taken a while. Um, and there are some people, other students that I'm working with who are doing, um, doing machine learning. And currently not in this field that I know of that it's been used. Um, but it's definitely becoming more popular. And a lot of the results um, are quite interesting because there are sort of two different main ways that you can use machine learning. You can sort of tell it, um, you can do it either supervised or unsupervised. And what that means is you could say, let it figure out entirely these uh, similarities between different objects or whatever. Or you can sort of give it some clear definitions of what you want it to find. Um, and so when you do unsupervised learning, you can really discover say completely different things because it's not as biased as if our human expectations are, are giving it. Did that answer your question? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Any more questions? Okay. In that case, let's thank Hannah again. Okay. So that ends the official part of today. Let me remind you all, your homework is due uh, now. I see that there's lots of homework in Same's hand. Excellent. If you haven't given it to Same uh, or me yet, give it to us now. Tomorrow is a little bit lower intensity. We start at 10 AM for the last lecture on string theory. And after that, we will have a short break, and then the closing ceremony, and then lunch. So I'll see you all tomorrow. OK, bye-bye.
رايحين احنا نعملها جنب بير زيت للتراث اللي بده يجي معنا على الخمسه بنطلع من, من هون او يعني بنطلق من, من المنطقه في بير زيت البلد القديمه مشي باص او مشي بنشوف <تصفيق>